Good morning, everybody. Yeah, there's a lot of cat profile picks. Uh, Professor Gazillo? Yes. Do you mind if I ask you a quick question about Project One? Uh, if it's quick, sure. Uh, actually, you know, I'll ask you in office hours then. That's okay. Fine. Yeah, I see there's a bunch of questions on Piazza that I, that I haven't gotten to. Um, and yeah, okay. I'll have office hours. Around one, right? Yeah. All right, cool. I'll just ask you then. then. Thank you. Okay. Just make sure I have everything ready. Okay, uh, let's see how many people have joined so far. About 37. All right, we might as well get started now. Um, let me see, there's some other questions. How are you, somebody asked, how will you know Oh, how are you able to know how much content will cover three hours worth of material? Uh, I don't know. I don't actually know. Um, if you have a way to help me figure that out, by all means, let me know. Somebody said the project was pretty fun. Good. I thought the, I think the project's fun too. Uh, some announcements. So there's no, there's no 2 p.m. lab, unfortunately. Uh, Josh can't make it. But it will be recorded, so everyone can can uh, can view that. Um, I I try to cover a, the if you have a time limit, the kind of work fills the time. So I try to make sure that I cover a particular topic every week, and uh, just sort of hope that I have enough material for for uh, for a little over. For almost three hours. Somebody asked, we should only upload the files that we have before calling make. Yeah, so this is this is really just a version control convention that you, in general, you don't need to push any files that are generated. Now, if those generated files take a long time to generate or they require some special tooling, it's appropriate to push those in the source and in, in the repository as well, but it's source version control. It's supposed to be for meant for source code. Um, Josh also made a really great simple video to show how to test your compiler. Because I, I, I noticed in the toy compiler, some people were generating code, assembly code, and then not bothering to try to compile that or try to assemble that assembly code. Uh, this, this is, Good to do in any programming where you don't just sort of trust the output of your compiler you, you actually or of your of your whatever program you're writing you actually validate that the output is correct um, and you can even use that to as a to build a test suite to start making sure that as you continue to program in the future that that output hasn't changed the past working out output uh, has not has not changed so that's called regression testing um, but yeah, I would recommend watching watching Josh's video. I think it's a nice short for people with no attention span. It's 90 seconds. Uh, be sure to watch it. And remember, no 2 p.m. laps today. Feel free to go to the 431 or watch the uh, recordings of, of the lab. Another announcement is, uh, this is a little early to, to tell you this, but uh, I won't be able to attend office hours on November 10th. I'll try to remind you um, before that before that day. I'm, I'm uh, giving a talk. Actually, if you're interested in seeing, I'm giving a talk at the uh, Linux Open Source uh, Summit on some of my uh, research work and how it can help uh, maintenance maintenance tasks. Um, 
so I'll be recording that tab. Uh, yeah, I'll post a link to it. So I actually, it's due today. I have to record it today. So everything's set up to go, but I got to record it. And uh, uh, yeah, feel free to watch it and watch all the talks there. I mean, it's a very cool um, uh, industrial style conference uh, where they go over all, all kinds of issues in Linux kernel development and maintenance. It's, um, there's good stuff if you're interested in kind of low level stuff. Uh, I, this is not particularly general audience stuff. I don't know if a TED talk would be. And then you get extra credit for watching it. You get extra life credit for watching uh, for watching talks. All right. Okay. Let, let's let's begin. Uh, so yeah, project one stuff. I, actually, today's lecture might be short enough where we can just go into questions early about project uh, project one and then of course office hours and I'll try to stay a little after in office hours as well because there's no 2 p.m. lab uh, and I'll, I'll cover that I'll, I'll answer all the piazza questions and I'll, I'll answer everyone's questions in, in office hours about project one and just just to remind you for those of you who are worried about not turning it in on time you should definitely strive to turn it in on time but it's okay to to mess up. Uh, the late policy is really lenient for programming projects. I really, really just want you to get the coding done on your own and getting it to work. Uh, and because it's a good, it's a good, it, there's like kind of sort of textbook programming. And then there's when you actually program, there's all these little nuances to program that makes it really, um, really hard to kind of understand if you just read a book about programming. There's lots and lots of tiny little details to debugging and getting your software right that I think is really important to kind of struggle through and get through. So the next project will be just that much easier. Or when you're, if you're working in a job, it'll be just that much easier to um, work on your own in programming. And what's great about it, like in that video Josh showed you, is that in so much of programming is very much do it yourself. You can, oh yeah, my green shirt is being, it wasn't, it wasn't a problem before, but okay, this is, this is kind of funny. I'm like invisible man now. Um, with programming, it's very much do it yourself. You can, you don't really need anyone to tell you whether something is right or not because you have a machine that you can automatically check whether something is right. You can write software to even check whether your software is right. So I really want people to, to take advantage of this late policy not to just push everything to the end of the semester, because if you try to do all these projects in a week or one night, I mean, I couldn't do them in one night. And I've programmed this kind of project like several times already, and I could not do it in one night. Uh, just the amount of time and labor it takes is way more than, than a night or a couple of days. Um, so the blade policy is there to really let you make mistakes and redo it and, and get it right. Uh, without getting penalized for trying to get it right. Now you will be penalized if you just wait till the end of the semester and don't turn anything in. We have to end the semester at some point. Uh, yeah, I've been talking to somebody who's asking about when we check the late later submissions. The we uh, I've been talking to the TAs about this. So the TAs are working on the automated scripts for grading, and I think we'll probably do just a rerun of the grading uh, like once every week or two. And, uh, and just update the grades on web courses. We'll probably do something, but we'll let you guys know once we, I mean, we, we don't even have, we haven't even graded the first project yet. So we'll, we'll um, let you guys know about this later uh, in the semester, in a week or two, once we have the first grading, once the first grading done. Okay, let's, uh, let's get to today's, today's lecture. Uh, so today uh, is the final section of the compiler front end. Uh, if you recall, the way this course is set up, we had all the introductory material, getting you used to the kinds of system software you need for doing this project. Um, an overview of compilers. I was trying to beat into your head. A compiler is um, a piece of code that is generating code. It's taking in code as input and it's generating code as output. Uh, and we went over simple C, a very much stripped down version of C that we're, that we're writing a compiler for in this class. Compilers are broken into usually, well, 
compilers are broken into two main phases, the front end and the back end, although nowadays uh, real world compilers have this middle end, which doesn't really make sense as words, but they have this intermediate language that you, uh, the front end compiles into and the back end compiles from. Uh, somebody said their friend at Harvard had a presentation about Chomsky yesterday. I'm guessing it was remote. Uh, and um, so today is the last section of the compiler front end. We've lexed and parsed our language into an abstract syntax tree. And now we're going to do some static type checking to try to rule out certain kinds of errors that can happen at runtime. The type checker is a, an automated way of basically proving that your code is correct for certain under certain conditions. And then next week, and today is, of course, project one's deadline. And starting today, project two will be implementing the type checker on the abstract syntax tree that project one produces. And then starting next week, we'll start looking at how the back end works, how we actually generate assembly code by walking this type checked abstract syntax tree. All right, so today, um, I don't have a lot of new notes. There's really just my slides that I had from last year's class and the project. So the project, there's a lot of, I've given you a template and a lot of work already done for the type checker. Uh, and so that's on, that's kind of a double-edged sword because that, that gives you a lot of code to work with. Um, but it also means you have to kind of understand the code and the template that I've given you. So for, a, for the second half of the class, we're gonna just go into the project in detail uh, we'll implement a couple of the type checking functions together. And I'll basically give you a subset of the language type checking for a small subset of the language. So hopefully that'll give you enough with all the references and you have the code available and a description of the, the type specification. Hopefully that'll be enough for you to be able to work on your own and fill out the rest of the type checker. Uh, I haven't posted a project yet as an assignment, but on the website, Project two is up, although it says project one there, which is nonsensical. Okay. I don't even really need a subtitle. Okay, so project two is uh, up on the website. I'll put it in web courses uh, soon, but this uh, website has everything you need, hopefully everything you need in order to download the template source code, get your current project updated to actually compile the type checker and run it, and a whole bunch of specification about how the type system should work in informal English language specification. Okay, but before we get into that, oh, that, that's a good question. So somebody asked, does project one need to be fully functional for project two to work? So yeah, the parser does need to be functional but so you won't get completely penalized if you just mess up one part of the project. I've pre-compiled a working version of project one, and this is available. Uh, so this is optional step four, and I'll go into this when I talk about the compiler more, but basically I've given you a pre-compiled version of project one that you can just link with your, your part. You, you have to, you have to do a little um, jump a few, jump through a few hoops to make sure you don't, compile your project one, um, but it's not too bad. And I'll walk through that in the, the second half of class today. Uh, but one caveat is this is pre-compiled on the Vagrant virtual machine. So it should work on all of your virtual machines, but it may not work on your host OS. So just keep that in mind. If you have problems with it, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Okay, so let's get into some of the basics of types. Make files are extremely finicky. I've tried to give detailed instructions about uh, modifying it. It's, it's a very small amount of patch you have to make in order to use the pre-compiled one. And we'll talk about it in, um, in the second half of the course. Okay, so let's talk about types, what they are, why we have them in programming languages, what they're good for and uh, how we actually implement types in a language like C. 
So the main question is why use types? So I've given some answer here, but I'm curious what you guys think. What do you think of having types at all? I mean, they're, uh, they're an annoyance because the compiler complains to you, uh, but do you guys like types? Do you prefer statically typed languages? Do you like dynamically typed languages like Python where you don't get any kind of type errors at compile time? What do you see as types being used for? So security, security is a good, a good point. It adds kind of, it's at security because it ensures that there are certain problems you, you can't uh, write in, certain bugs you can't write in your code. And somebody's asking a nightmare in debugging. If you haven't declared your variables or you have a misspelling of a variable, then it may take you a long time to figure out that you just misspell the variable name. So very, checking that a, a variable usage is, is one thing that types do. So I guess a lot of students have been learning C and these the statically typed languages. And so some people are scared of Python that you don't have to do any kind of types. Yeah, so this is also a really good question about does, does Python have types? Does it have a type system? You don't actually say this variable is a type. You don't, you don't say this variable is an int, but this is a good question. Does Python have types. Uh, and somebody points out the difference between float and integer arithmetic, which is something that we'll, we'll look at today as well. Right, yeah, Python 3, uh, at some point they started adding, they wanted to be able to allow developers to say what the types are. There is some active research on, on what's called gradual typing which is taking a dynamic language and adding types to some part of the language and seeing what happens when you start interfacing the um, type checked part of the language, the statically type checked part of the language with the dynamically type checked part of the language and seeing if you can, um, uh, instead of having to go through and add static typing to your whole program at once, if you can do that uh, little by little over time. So strictly speaking, the kind of core reason to use types is that it actually prevents runtime errors when the program when the program runs. And to see why that is, let's look at what uh, typed versus untyped really means. So formally, a type is really just a set of values, a range of possible values that a symbol can take at runtime, coupled with the set of operations on those values. If you take integer, for instance, what is an integer? Integers can't take floating point numbers. They can't take doubles. Uh, and so the int type is a set of integers on our machine. It's, if it's unsigned, it's from zero to, you know, two to the 32 or whatever the bit width of your integer is. It can represent all that range of integers. And it's the integer arithmetic operations on those integers. So as somebody already pointed out, integer division works differently from floating point division. And the hardware, the machine, actually has different assembly instructions that you call in order to do integer arithmetic versus floating point arithmetic. And one thing to keep in mind, as we'll, as we'll see a little bit uh, later and when we do the back end, if you think about how data is represented at the machine level, you all took computer organization. It's all done with binary numbers. It's all digital. And the way we represent integers in binary numbers, we all learned, you know, two's complement and for unsigned integers, just the classic base two representation. Uh, but floating point also uses the same set of, of, of uh, binary digit combinations of bit combinations. It just it has a different meaning to the uh, processor's operations that work on that data. So the processor has specific instructions for doing integer arithmetic versus floating point arithmetic. And in order to make sure that we're not using the wrong instructions for the kind of data we're expecting it to be used for, one of the main things that the type system does is enforces the usages of operations on a particular data type. And this is why in C you declare each symbol 
uh, the type of each symbol. You have to declare the type of each symbol. And as we'll see when we write the compiler, the compiler can actually validate at compile time without even having to run the program, can actually validate that these symbols are being used correctly. Uh, and so we have this distinction between typed languages, which do this kind of restriction on variables range of values. And so Python is in here. So even though it's not statically typed, Python is a typed language, C, Java, et cetera. And some untyped languages such as Lisp or assembly don't make this kind of restriction. Assembly, since you programmed it computer organization, you could manip you can call any operation you want on any memory location or any register you want in assembly and you will not get any, the assembler and the machine will not give you any kind of um, warning that this, that you've used uh, an operation on the wrong data type because the assembly language doesn't even give you a way to say this is the data type that I want for this, for this memory object, or at least usually when you're programming an assembly, uh, you don't have a machine checked way of, of specifying that. So somebody asked, can we think of data type operations as similar to methods on an object? Actually, yeah, yeah, you can think of it like that. An object is, a, is in some sense, an object is a way to extend the type system of your language or of your, uh, yeah, extend the type system of the language for your program. So if you learn like, like Java, they, they bind object orientation with extending the type system with subtyping. And so when you make an object, you're making a new data type as well. And for statically typed languages at compile time, the compiler will check to make sure that you're using those objects correctly in the right way. That when you call a function on it, that you're only calling a function that's defined for that object. And you're only uh, um, doing operations on objects of the right type. So yeah, there's a very strong connection here between object orientation, at least when used for, um, when combined with, with type systems and type systems for primitives like int and bool. And yeah, so for those languages that have object orientation, or at least the statically typed ones like C++ and Java, the object orientation is tightly bound with the type system. Adding new classes is also extending the type system and adding new types to the language, similar to how a struct adds a new type to the C language. Okay, and we can, we can uh, so somebody mentioned security, which is a really good point. And why we have security with type systems is because we can help prevent these kinds of, certain kinds of runtime errors. And in fact, there's research work that extends the type system even further than what we see in something like C to actually enforce security properties, like making sure that secret values are not flowing to unprotected outputs. This is called taint analysis or information flow analysis. And there are techniques that actually extend the type system to do this because the type system is this compile time, at least for statically typed languages, it's a compile time uh, check that will make sure the program won't even get compiled or run if there is some possible input that could have an error. Uh, and so we can make this distinction between uh, safe languages and unsafe languages. And this is from a researcher named Luca Cardelli. I'll put a link to his paper describing this. Uh, and he points out that type systems, their goal is to um, handle mostly untrapped errors. So the distinction between these two is that a trapped error is something that the processor or the machine catches, like a null pointer error or divide by zero. And these are, these are the kinds of errors that the C type checker does not catch at compile time, at least not in general. Uh, and well, one of the reasons is that these are very hard to check statically. Actually, it's impossible to check them at runtime um, exactly precisely. Uh, but it can be very difficult to, in C at least, because of pointer arithmetic and all the manipulations you can do with pointers, can be very difficult to automatically check this in a way that doesn't reject even uh, doesn't reject lots of valid programs. So trapped errors are those that are terminated by the machine when you encounter these at runtime. Untrapped errors are those where we we uh, thought that a value was supposed to be an integer or a floating point. Um, but we accidentally used an operation that was for the wrong type that we didn't expect. 
and it's these kinds of untrapped errors that, it, it, you know, there's some argument that these kind of untrapped errors are a little bit more pernicious because the hard, nothing will, the hardware won't even catch these kinds of errors. And these lead to these difficult to debug logic errors, logic bugs that you just have to go back and trace your program to work out. And you may not even notice until you use some uh, unexpected input or input that you haven't tested. You may not even notice that you get this, get this kind of error. Uh, and so a safe language is a language that prevents untrapped errors and some, un some trapped errors. And this is just kind of definitional in the, the type checking literature. Uh, and so to, to come back to Python versus C, each language has a decision to make about when they do this type checking. So in this class, we're working with a C-like language and in C and other languages that are also statically typed like Java, C++, uh, most of the checking happens at compile time. And so if it happens at compile time, we call that static checking or static type checking or the static semantics of the language. And this is why you may be annoyed when your compiler will, will yell at you and give you an error. Um, but the reason is because whatever you've written has violated the assumptions by the type checker. And even though it's annoying, it's actually safe because it's actually, there, there's an upside to it, which is it makes sure that you actually can't get a program running that has these kinds of, kinds of these type errors. And then we have uh, a runtime or dynamically checked type, type system. So Python is an example of this. Even though there's no type declarations or type annotations man that are mandatory in the language, uh, you'll still get type errors at runtime. And let me see if I, when do I, yeah, okay. I'll show this in a second, but well, I'll actually show uh, the difference between Python and Java and, and static versus runtime, runtime type. So yeah, somebody already asked, why is Java both compile time and runtime? And uh, it's, not, um, it's not because of exceptions. It's because you can, it's because some of the type checking happens at, happens at runtime. So even though Java is statically typed, there are some aspects of the type system that, that in, uh, provide uh, safety guarantees that is unlike, uh, how can I say this? So let's take an example. Let's take an example of array out of bounds errors, buffer overflow errors one of the most common software bugs for, for security vulnerabilities. C, C's type system only runs statically and checking this kind of buffer overflow automatically at runtime, at, at compile time for various reasons is, is very tricky to do, very tricky to get right in a way that doesn't reject lots and lots of programs. And so Java's solution to this is to add the array out of bounds checking at runtime instead of compile time. So in that sense, Java is a kind of blend of static and runtime checking, although most of the checking, most of the type system is enforceable at, at compile time. There are aspects of the type system to, in order to guarantee safety for all Java programs, there are some checks that happen at runtime. This is also true for, for subclassing and subtyping. You can actually check the type of an object at runtime with the instance of keyword. And the um, runtime program will actually also ensure that you're, that you're using the right um, class, class typing at runtime as well. So kind of an interesting uh, fact from the research world, for a very long time, the Java, des Java designers thought that Java was, uh, or considered Java's type system to be sound. That is, it uh, doesn't allow any um, unsafe programs to be run. But it turned out through some formal work on type systems that some researchers were able to find some very strange corner case that actually allowed um, some, some kind of buffer overflow or some kind of uh, subversion of the type system, even with the runtime and static type checks. Uh, and Java was, was corrected for that. And so they, yeah, so this is some of the benefits of doing this formal uh, proofs of, of type, type correctness. Uh, okay, yeah, this is, this is what I was sort of getting into with Java versus C. Uh, we can make this distinction between strongly checked languages and weakly checked languages. 
So Java would be an example of a strongly checked language where all programs that pass the type checker have this good behavior. They have safe behavior. That is, they don't allow any of these forbidden errors. They don't allow any untrapped errors and they don't allow the trapped errors that the language defines as, as the type checker not allowing. A weakly checked language is one in which it has a static, a static or runtime type checker, but it still allows some programs that violate type safety through the type checker. They still allow them to be compiled and run. And it's not that the program is, well, I mean, yeah, the, the language does allow unsafe languages, but this is different from a language that has no type checking. Uh, like in C, for instance, C has this static checking, but for kind of historical and systems programming reasons, it does allow subversion of the type system pretty much intentionally. At least it's in, it's in pretty well-defined cases that it allows it. Or it, it does it because of a trade-off between performance and, um, and safety of the program. So here's a table. So here's this paper from Luca Cardelli, who's, uh, who's did some, some seminal work on formalizing type systems. And that's where I got a lot of this content from about these different distinctions between languages. And he has this nice uh, table that shows the distinction between typed and untyped languages and safe and unsafe languages. So he, uh, the safe and typed languages are languages like Java or ML, which is a functional programming language. And, un, um, and untyped but safe languages like, like Lisp, because Lisp only has like one data type, doesn't have to do any checking. Uh, and it, yeah. Um, and also, uh, and in the uh, unsafe category, C, even though it's typed, is uh, unsafe because this type checker still allows programs that have untrapped errors to, to go through. Uh, because it allows, say, buffer overflows, for instance. And assembler is an example of a language that doesn't have a type system and is, of, of course, also unsafe because you can do whatever you want with data in memory. Okay, so let's take a look at this distinction between Python and C. Let me get Okay, let's consider this program on the right side here. Uh, let me see if I, well, let's see. Let's see what we should look at first. So let's look for instance at, let, yeah, let's just consider some of C's type system, type checking on the right here. So we've got a, uh, a program that just prints started running when it starts running and it casts the integer two into a double and multiplies that double with 1.7 and assigns it to an integer y. Okay, so what do you think this program will uh, print out when I run this program? Print out error. Well, I just compiled it. So is this a, is this a compile time error or a, 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 a runtime error or nothing? Or is this legal? Let's see. So we, I compiled it. No compiler error. Compiler didn't, didn't, didn't complain. 
and I run it and I get the number three. So what happened here? Uh, I'll cover this in a little bit, but um, yeah, so this, this is called type coercion. And even though these are different types, the C compiler will actually behind the scenes uh, do this type conversion for you. So they have this hierarchy of types. And if you convert from double to int, it'll truncate. If you convert from int to double, it'll call the machine instruction that does that conversion. So let's look at a case where we're using some other, other types that um, may be less safe. Okay, so here's a, an example where we're taking a pointer to a character. We're signing it to this hello world uh, uh, constant. And then we're creating a new integer y2 that adds one to that temp2 integer pointer. Uh, so any predictions about compile time? Will this, will C reject this at compile time? So somebody's saying, I hope so, I hope yes. So unfortunately, it doesn't actually reject it. It gives a warning um, because uh, modern compilers will, will warn you of this behavior. But this is an example of C's type system allowing what is really unsafe. Well, depending on what your definition of unsafe is, it'll allow basically pointer, pointer arithmetic. It allows pointers to be manipulated as integers. Uh, so fortunately, modern compilers will warn you of this, uh, but the, you know, the C standard doesn't consider this a type error, but modern C compilers will actually warn you and say, you have this mismatched type. And somebody's asking, uh, will it treat the character to an ASCII value? So recall that this is a pointer to a character. So this attempt two is actually holding some memory location and then we're adding one to it. And so somebody's asking, what does uh, percent, uh, percent X do? Percent X prints a value as hex. So maybe, okay, these, these are complicated examples. Maybe I should have started with simpler ones, but let's, uh, let me go, uh, before we get to printing these things, let's just print the, um, print the actual, print the actual integer here. So this is just printing the hex value. So let me print the hex value of temp2. And let me print the hex value of y2. So as we saw, we get a warning about this. And we got it, we got a couple of warnings. Even though C's type system doesn't reject this, modern C compilers will at least do this type checking and give you, give you a warning when there's this potential for an untrapped error. And so here, recall, I'm printing the, the pointer itself, I'm printing the address, and I'm printing the integer itself. So what do you think the output is going to be for this? If we take a look at the first one, the first one is whatever the memory address of hello world is. And we might even be able to see this address. Uh, let's see if we can actually see this address. Oh no, it doesn't print. Oh, it doesn't print the uh, global stuff. So that address is whatever the linker moves this global data to whatever address gets put that it, uh, that the linker uh, puts it to is that address. Ah, so somebody asked, uh, somebody already started getting ahead here, which is really good. Uh, so notice that Y2 is just whatever that literal 
memory address number is, Y2 is just adding one to it. So somebody's asking, would Y2 be the address for Hello World? Apparently the British version, that's, that's, that's pretty funny. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. So with, with pointer arithmetic in C, you can treat memory addresses as integer types in the language and do integer arithmetic on them because memory addresses are really just unsigned integers. And the C's type system does not make a distinction between, or at least that allows you to not make a distinction between pointer types and integer types. And so that's exactly right. This Y2 has, um, well, actually, let's, let's take a look at it. So let's look at the string value of temp2. And this is not type safe, but let's look at the string value. I mean, we, we should probably do a um, type casting to be explicit about, about this. That'll, that should remove any warnings as well. So now I'm just printing out temp2 as a string because uh, temp2 is a pointer to a character. And then I'm casting y2 into be a, to be a character pointer and printing it out as a string. Um, so this still even complains because the uh, bit width of these two types are, are different. Oh, I got a segmentation fault. That's oh, this might be let me check something. I think this has to do with the bit widths. That's my guess. Oh, that's strange. Huh. I'm actually not sure why. This is giving a seg fault. Anyone? <laughs> anyone? Anyone uh, see why? Well, it should be the same address, and it is the same address. Let's try this. Let's see what the address so yeah, it still doesn't like it. Yeah, I'm not sure why. Um, but temp2 prints, temp2 is a pointer to a character. I mean, a, a character array is a, is a, um, okay, I'm going to have to look into this and see why it doesn't let me I thought it had to do with the bit widths. Ah, maybe because it's unsigned. Nope. Okay, I have no idea actually. Maybe the bit width size. Okay, I'm gonna have to see why this is the case. I don't know why actually. <laughs> I've gotten myself into something I can't explain right now. Uh, but I'll, let's look at that later and move on. 
Um, it shouldn't matter. I mean, these two here, I would think are equivalent. But there must be, hmm, yeah, I'm not sure why. I'd have to take a debugger to, uh, to figure out why. I don't think I need to dereference it because it's a string is a character array. It's the string is a char I mean a string is a character array. Now the difference between a a, a pointer type and an array type um, doesn't doesn't actually uh, shouldn't shouldn't matter. But it does. Oh no, no, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So I, I don't know why it um why why it doesn't like y two. Printing Y2. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll figure that out. I'll figure that out later why it's not actually allowing me to save the new address into an integer. But anyway, this is, uh, this should be unsafe. I mean, this is unsafe anyway. So I did. I'll just figure that out. Let me save this for later. Okay, anyway, so moving on, uh, we already looked at pointer arithmetic. Ah, okay, so let's look at, let's look at, um, let's, let's return to this example where we had this unexpected behavior by some where it allowed assigning a double to an integer and just did truncation. So it might be, it's tempting to think that uh, this is the types, the type checker just not um, checking at all whether there's an int or a double. But actually behind the scenes, C is tracking whether variables are doubles or ints and inserting code that will do the conversion between those, between those data types at the assembly level. And I think we can see this by looking at the assembly. Yeah, so here, on this line here, this instruction, which was inserted by the C compiler, this instruction is a special ins assembly instruction that does this conversion between double precision floating point numbers and to signed integers. So even though the type system doesn't give us any sort of error, C behind the scenes, instead of giving an error, will insert in special instructions, special assembly instructions, or if those instruction assembly instructions don't exist, will insert code to actually do the conversion between these two types of data because the operations uh, because the operations for integer and floating point arithmetic are different assembly operations. So somebody asks, can you cast an int as an array? Okay, well let's, let's, let's see. So if you're saying if I have some integer like uh, An integer like this, can I cast this into an array? So an array is just is the same as a as a um, 
as a pointer. So let's see what happens. All right. So, um, yeah, so you can't even, well, okay. So we'll see this when we get into the when we get into the uh, back end of the compiler. Ah, okay. So this it actually rejects it. It actually does reject this. Let's see if I can force it to not reject it. Still doesn't like it. Yeah, so um, so the thing is, if you want to declare an array in C, uh, there's two ways to declare arrays. You can either declare uh, an array without a size, which is basically just the same equivalent to a pointer. Or you can declare it with a size, in which case it allocates the, the array for you onto the stack. We'll see that when we look at how uh, variables get allocated in memory. But in this case, this is really no different from just saying int star, and then I'm assigning int star with, uh, yeah, it could be why we're having trouble with the char array, but mm, yeah. I'm going to get into a rat's nest if I continue looking at that, and and I, I have to really open up a debugger and see why uh, why it's not letting me. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. I'm, I'm curious. I mean, when I sit here and do this, I don't want to make the class devolve into you know my just personal uh, coding session, uh, which is what I which is what I'll do if I'm on my own. Okay, so let, let's yeah. So somebody asked about casting. Arrays. So arrays in C are really just pointers. They're really just pointers to the type. The only difference is when you declare a fixed size array, it's allocating that on the stack, which is used to store local variables. But we'll see more of that when we look at when we look at um, when we look at how we actually build the type system. Uh, for now, since we're really just looking at the the type system and how it behaves, we can see that here, just like a just as if array was a pointer, the type checker doesn't care if you do this cast. Modern compilers will warn you about this, but the casts are allowed. And we can see the before and after values of array uh, by, running, by running this program, by printing each of them out and running it. Wait a minute. Why is why is this not compiling? Oh, I still have an array. Oh, never mind. I still have a type. Still have a type error. I wasn't even seeing that. Uh, well, okay. So it seems like this the the C type system won't let us. I should be able to. Yeah, the CTI system won't let us do this. Yeah, the CTI system won't let us do this um, do this assignment. Yeah, it won't even let us do this do this assignment. I mean, what we could do is well, yeah. So the type system is checking at least for arrays. It's checking that you're not assigning integers to an array type. So yeah, I can't just change the address of this array, apparently. Uh, there's probably a way to do it using the technique I'll show in a bit with this void star. Um, but yeah, the type system will actually protect you against this kind of uh, reassigning array, array types. So let's see if I can, yeah, it won't let me, it won't let me, um, declare an array without, 
yeah, we, I'd, I'd have to just make this a pointer, which is the same thing we saw before, which is really just the same thing. It's just, so it's just, it's just the same thing if I use a pointer, array is some address and then I update that address to be something else. Let's see if there's some kind of something printable at this address. Probably gonna get a seg fault. Okay. Okay, so this is a little bit rambly. So sorry, sorry about that. I'm kind of uh, just uh, rambling this. Any anything else that somebody wants to try? Try like uh, messing with the uh, C type system. So as you can see, it's actually the C is actually pretty permissive about 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 types, particularly when it comes to pointers and integers, and when it comes to different um, like double and float, different kinds of integers. It will do this. It'll allow the program to compile, maybe with a warning. And then instead insert um, uh, casts between those, or insert instructions that will cast between those between those types. All right, any questions so far? I know this is kind of rambly. I kind of went into maybe a weird direction, but any uh, questions so far? So far about this, or is anybody just totally lost? Because I, I know I went a little bit, a little bit uh, in a, a bit of a tangent there. I mean, the main thing is, is that if, I've, if I have two different types and they shouldn't be assigned to each other, like if I have a struct, if I declare some struct and I have some integer, then usually the programmer won't actually want to be able to assign the, won't, won't allow assigning values between two different types. That's the kind of crux of what type checking does. It prevents, it, it uh, makes sure that the memory addresses only hold data of a certain type restricted to, to a certain set of values like a set of integers or a set of structs or a set of objects. And without having to even run the program, the type checkers, the type checker can actually walk through the AST figure out the types of every operation in that program and make a decision about whether they want to, the compiler wants to actually uh, generate assembly code for it or just say, hey, developer, I don't think you wanted to do this. So I'm not even going to compile this. Rewrite your code. I'm pretty sure this is not what you wanted. So a case like this, as people mentioned before, um, one of the benefits of doing this is it does help with mistakes. It does help with mistakes like this. If I'm writing this complex piece of software and I forgot whether my struct had or whether X had some current struct value that I was working on, or whether X was already declared to something else, then the type checker is going to catch that error for me. Or if I just have a misspelling, like I say my strut instead of my, my struct, the type system will also check to, to make sure that you're actually using symbols that have been declared before. Uh, so somebody asked, they're unclear about how the type checker gets that from walking through the AST. So I'll go into that in great detail in the second half of the lecture about how this, how type checkers, at least a simple type checker like C will actually work. Ah, so somebody's saying I couldn't get the AST without the types being correct to begin with. So, so recall, this is the difference between the language that we're compiling, the source language, and the language that we're programming the compiler in. So here I'm talking about the source languages types. To write the compiler, we have to write the compiler in a programming language. And if we use a typed language like C, we need to make sure that our program is correct. So if your compiler itself is not compiling and you're getting a static type error, when you're writing your compiler. That just means when you wrote the compiler, you made some mistake that the compiler is catching for you. Yeah, this is always what's super confusing about compilers, the source language, the target language, and the, the language that we're programming the compiler in. So we have to write code that will walk through the, the AST representation of the program and figure out what all the types are for all the expressions in this language and make sure that they're being used correctly. Uh, so C is a tricky case to look at because its type system is we it's weakly typed. 
So as we saw with, with, even with the, the places where we got warnings, it'll allow mismatched types to be assigned to each other in some cases. Uh, largely, this is due to the support for pointer arithmetic, where you can use an integer to basically explore and modify any data and memory you want. So somebody asked, why does, oh, well, that's a good question. So why, why, doesn't, why don't people change C to be strongly checked? Um, well, there's, so this gets outside of uh, technical reasons. C is decades old. Uh, there is billions of lines of code in C that when, when recompiled will then break. Uh, and there's also a really, uh, there's, a, there's a decent argument at least right now that, well, so certainly for systems programming like low level Linux programming, some pointer manipulation and unsafe code is necessary to write that kind of code. For instance, um, well, if you take an operating system class or read about it online, you'll see that just in order to write an operating system, you need to do some machine code instructions. You need to put assembly in your C code. You just, you just, there are some instructions that are just not available at the programming language level for you to do, like setting up interrupt handlers um, or doing system calls and, and switching between hardware protection modes that, uh, I mean, conceivably you could write a programming language that supports this um, and then has some special library that, that has unsafe code in it. And this is actually the strategy that modern system programming languages take like Go and Rust. Rust by default enforces this kind of type safety, but they have a special flag or a special annotation you can say, well, I want this to be unsafe, an unsafe part of the language. And so in, in some sense for system programming, you need to do you need to do some manipulation of memory. You need to do some direct assembly coding, which doesn't really, um, you know, there's almost not a safe, safe way to do that, or at least you'd have to update. Well, I shouldn't say that. Current systems, the way the operating systems work is that you use uh, what is unsafe assembly to just do uh, hardware level operations, like switching protection modes at hardware level or installing interrupt, interrupt uh, handlers. Um, but in spite of that, one of the problems with C is that it's unsafe by default, it allows unsafe behavior by default, whereas modern system programming languages like Rust and Go are safe by default, and then you have to explicitly say when you want to be unsafe. Uh, and so, so C is, you know, C has been around for a long time. It's pretty difficult to, I mean, you it would be a new language, basically, if you made that change. It would be a very, it would be a language that's not at all backwards compatible. Existing language, existing code would just break if, if, we, if we did this. And so, you know, somebody said C is now a law of nature. Um, I mean, C is still a human made, a man-made thing. And it's, and the rules around C are not laws of nature. They're, they're design decisions. Um, yeah, they're just design decisions. I mean, all these are design decisions. And one thing that I hope you get out of this class is that you don't have to just take for granted what the language does, that that's some human that designed that that way. And if you open up the hood and look at how they're designed, you see that this is just design choices and engineering, which means that you have the freedom to make your own design choices and implement them the way you like. Uh, uh, so somebody emailed me, uh, messaged me privately that um, it might be something with GCC because with Clang, that program works. The one where we had LO, LO World, that worked. Okay, so maybe um, maybe something else is going on or maybe there's some kind of, yeah, maybe something else is going on. Interesting. Yeah, I was, I was not, not expecting that. Uh, but yeah, so that's why C, um, you know, was originally designed like this. There wasn't as much development of this type safety at the time, not, not quite as much. And language designers have just gotten a lot better at making this trade-off between the annoyance of having really strict type checking that makes it really hard for you to write your code uh, and also can, can lead to performance issues potentially uh, versus the kind of wild west of anything goes in C or lots of things go in C, um, which means you have, you have the, the onus, the burden of making sure your code is safe. Um, but the, the guarantee, but what you get is a really lightweight compiler that compiles really fast. You get code that doesn't have um, much difference from if you wrote assembly code. 
in a lot of cases. And so you can get really fast performant code, which is really important for low level programming, like the, the kernel level. Because if your kernel is slow, that makes menus, everything is slow. If your kernel is really, really fast, then application developers at least have some chance of getting really good performance out of their machine. Um, but, but anyway, and yeah, so another issue is that some of these kinds of errors, like null pointer errors, are, uh, require a lot of, uh, they require to, to get them to be supporting pointer arithmetic is really, really hard to do. To be able to check in complex pointer arithmetic whether there's a null pointer or not is really hard to do. And so if your type checker is rejecting programs that it thinks might have a null pointer error, uh, but the developer knows they don't, or the developer's written a proof that they don't, then, um, then what do you do? You have to rewrite your program to satisfy the, uh, satisfy the type checker. So that's why program, um, languages like Java will insert runtime checks for array out of bounds because they're very uh, hard to do at compile time. The problem with that is that means every array access has to have extra code that checks to see, am I out of bounds? Whereas C doesn't do that. And if you use C safely, you can have better performance than something like Java, which has runtime checks for every array access. All right, so that was a nice little tangent on language design. Uh, oh yeah, so let's look at let's look at Python now. So let's look at cases where uh, so C is very permissive about types. It'll do this typecasting for you. Let's look at um, let's look at a Python example. So you don't necessarily have to know Python to do this, uh, but let's so so recall in C that in some cases, like when we tried to assign an array to an integer, we would get a type error. The program the program wouldn't even compile, much less run. So let's look at something similar in let's look at something similar in Python. Here we're assigning x to some string constant. We're adding 1.7, a floating point number, to that string constant. And um, yeah, so in C, recall, when we tried to do that with a string, the compiler gave a warning, but it actually let us compile the program. And it had ended up doing pointer arithmetic, because in C, there are no strings in C. There's no string type. Strings are just literally a character array that you, as the programmer, have to manage on your own or use a library to manage. In Python, does, any, does anyone know, actually? So in Python, does anyone know what this, well, first of all, will this program uh, compile? So somebody's asking, if I print x, what will it be? OK. So somebody's saying this program will compile, so to speak. And will it run? Will I get a type error when this runs? So somebody says it will compile and somebody says it won't, it won't run. Okay. So let's see. So who thinks, so th people will think Python will reject it. All right, let's take a look. All right. So it compiled. I mean, I know this is not a compiled language, but behind the scenes, like a compiled language, it is doing the same front end processing that our compiler is doing or a C compiler is doing. And it's generating some, uh, intermediate code, some Python virtual machine code. Uh, and that compiled, that's, that's fine, because we can see that the program started running because it actually printed the started running uh, text when I, that, I, that I put at the beginning of the program. Notice when we compiled C, we didn't get anything printed out. The compiler just rejected the program uh, without even trying to run it. In this case, Python actually started running the program and then then it gave us this type error. So recall in C, when we tried to assign the array to, to, an int, to an int, the program wouldn't even run because the compiler just rejected the program right off the bat. In Python, the program compiled and started running. And during the execution of the program, we got this type error. So people are already saying, oh, you have to turn 1.7 into a string. Well, that's assuming that I, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, but Python is not making that assumption. Python is just saying, we think you made a mistake here. 
did you really want to add these things together? Uh, and if these were, you know, if these were different um, variables, like maybe I forgot that the, maybe I just forgot that value wasn't a string yet, value was a number. Maybe I just forgot. Maybe I was trying to do a bunch of arithmetic on it on 1.7 and I was confused as a programmer whether I wanted to do an arithmetic, uh, whether I wanted to do addition or concatenation. Um, because this symbol here, just like, so, so, so many people asked about minus in simple C. Minus is either unary minus or, or a binary operator for subtraction. It's the same symbol and people were wondering, well, is there a different, should I have a different representation of this in the AST? And the answer is you don't need it because the syntax helps you distinguish whether it's a unary minus or a binary minus. In this case, the type system allows us to distinguish whether this is a, an addition or a concatenation. So that's, so the, this, this um, static definition of the language allows us to, allows a compiler to automatically distinguish what the same symbol means. This is kind of like a, uh, a word in English having multiple meanings, a word in any language having multiple meanings, depending not only on where it's used in the sentence, but also how it's used, what, what, um, what the meaning of the symbols around them are, can dictate, uh, the, basically the context around it dictates the meaning of the word. That's why words can have multiple meanings. If you look in a dictionary, it might be confusing that a word has 10 meanings, um, but in, at least in some cases, the syntax will tell you the meaning, will distinguish the meaning. So that's like noun versus verb. The same word can have different meanings, whether a noun versus a verb. Uh, but also the context around it, the semantic context around it can also distinguish between meanings of the words. Now in English, of course, you have true ambiguities where um, the syntax and the context cannot tell you the difference and then you need, you need other, other mechanisms to, to distinguish it or you need to ask the listener or the, the speaker to, to make the sentence unambiguous. Uh, but yeah, so somebody pointed this out, the, the exact terminology used in programming language, which is operator overloading. And this plus here is a case of an overloaded operator. And in C, it's the same thing. So plus is overloaded uh, because it means integer arithmetic and floating point arithmetic and double arithmetic and short arithmetic. It means all these different kinds of arithmetic in C. Those actually correspond, as we'll see when we, um, well, uh, actually, no, we only have integer big kind of types in our language. So we won't see that. Uh, but if you look at the, the C compiler, it will actually generate different instructions for floating point arithmetic versus, versus uh, integer arithmetic. Short is, um, I think it, uh, it depends on the heart architecture you're on, uh, but I think on a 64-bit machine, I think short is 16-bit. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I think so, on a 64-bit on a architecture. Okay, question, question so far. Going into a lot of lot of different topics here. Questions so far about this? All right. So where do we leave off? We had C, where if there were, if the type specification of the language said you can't assign structs to integers or integers to structs, then the compiler won't even let you run this program. It won't even compile it. Won't ever even turn it into assembly. This is a statically checked type system. This is statically checked. Python is dynamically checked. The program started running before the language even checked whether there was a type error. So that's dynamically checked language. Yeah, so somebody asked, are we going to be implementing this error checking? Yes, you'll be implementing this. This is the project I'll talk about today. Uh, that you'll do for the next couple of weeks. You'll actually implement this static type checking like in C. So to see this distinction between static and dynamic, let's also, let's also, uh, let me read a, uh, let me read a command line argument here if I remember how to do this in Python. So let me add a condition here that says only print uh, 
So I'm gonna, so even if you don't know Python, all I'm saying here is only run this code if the argument that I pass in on the command line is greater than 10. Let's see if I can do. Okay. So all I did was I just input a command line argument, printed it, printed started running, assigned these two variables, x to some string, value to some floating point number. And then I put a test here that says, if my input argument as an integer is greater than 10, then run this code. Try to add a string and a floating point number. And notice that if I, um, if I put a value that is greater than 10, then I get the same kind of type error I saw before. But if I put a value that is less than 10, notice no type error. Why? What happened here? Why is there no type error when I run the program uh, with some inputs and there is a type error when I run the program with other inputs? Because the error is after the if. But contrast this with my C program, where if I have, if I do the same, so let's, let's say I do the same thing in my C program. So let's say if argv1 equals some character, so let's do the same thing in my C program here. So this is, this is pretty similar, right? I'm testing my input and only if that in, inputs, that test succeeds, then I run this assignment from an integer to a struct, right? So what's gonna happen? Can this program compile? What do you guys think? Will this program compile? So people are saying no. Okay, it doesn't compile. So this is, this is not weak versus strong. This is static versus dynamic checking. So regardless of what the inputs are, the static type checking accounts for all possible inputs to the program, whether there's an error in some possible path through that program. So that's why the program doesn't even compile. The compiler, the, the static type checker is checking whether for every possible input, is there some possible type error? Whereas in dynamic typing, the program will compile. It's not gonna check at compile time. And it's going to insert special checks at runtime, uh, special checks in the code, so that if you hit that check in one path through the program from one input, then you'll get a runtime error, an error at runtime like a seg fault is a runtime error. But if you never hit that code path from that, that certain input, then with a dynamic check, you'll never see that error. So somebody's asking, which is why it's safer? Yeah, so that there's a, yeah, so there's a trade-off here between safety, yeah. So in some sense, it's safer. Well, yeah, I, I, would, I would argue that yes, it's safer to have this static checking it's safer to have this static checking because you're accounting for all possible inputs to the program. Uh, this is especially important for security. So if you're doing, so if you're, um, if you have some buffer overflow that allows a vulnerability to do, you know, remote code execution, uh, if you have a test suite that never actually encounters that buffer overflow, then you'll never, then that test suite will never actually find that there's a buffer overflow and then again, instead some security researcher or attacker will find that buffer overflow and exploit your program. If you could account for buffer overflows for all possible inputs to the program, then you can rule that out for any possible input to the program. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it's better because if you insert these dynamic checks, like in Python, if you had a check every time you access the buffer like Java does, you could also get the same strong guarantee. The difference is you would get it at compile time versus you would get it maybe at some point when the program is running. Um, so, the, so some of the trade-offs here are that if you uh, do it while it's running, 
if you do this check while it's running and you deploy this software, your software may crash and you have to actually add new error handling. So this, so somebody asked about exceptions in Java. So this is what Java exceptions are for. They're a way to add error handling into the language so that you have to do this kind of error handling, or at least you can, you can, um, you can add code to safely recover from these kinds of error handling. With static checking, you can make sure that this kind of error won't happen at all during runtime. Uh, so what's the trade-off? So why, why not always do this at compile time? It turns out that there is this uh, fundamental limitation to doing this kind of static checking that uh, is credited to Turing's work on Turing machines. There are certain questions where you can't actually prove, there's actually a logical contradiction when you go to try to prove some properties of a program. So it turns out that at least in general, a static checker couldn't check precisely whether or not there is a uh, buffer overflow in a C program. Um, you can approximate it. You can allow, uh, you can make sure that you reject all null pointer errors, but you could never reduce your false positives. You would still have to have false positives. So let, let me talk about this in a second when I finish the slides, because this is a little bit um, uh, tricky to, re to reason through. But so basically there's this trade-off between uh, having false positives at compile time and rejecting programs even though they're safe uh, versus having dyna dynamic checks which have performance hits and um, force you to have some kind of uh, runtime error management for a program that, uh, that, that you didn't know had, it, had an error in it, but uh, you have to ha add the possibility at runtime that there uh, may be an error and then do some kind of recovery and handling from that. So somebody's asking, are we doing static or dynamic? Dynamic seems tough. Um, well, I wouldn't say one is necessarily harder to write than the other. Dynamic is just when you're generating code, you insert checks while you're running the code. So it's not necessarily harder. Um, but for, the, for our program, we're doing static checks. So static checks means during compilation, we write code that will, or we write code in our compiler that will check to make sure types are being used properly. If we were doing dynamic checks while we're generating code, we just add extra checks into the code, into the output code that um, check whether the types are being used properly. Now, of course, that means that you need to maintain the type information at runtime. So, okay, this will make a little bit more sense when we talk about how this stuff is actually implemented. Yeah, so one of the reasons why I do C is because, well, I do a lot of C um, related stuff in my research, uh, but also UCF still uses C as the uh, kind of first language, C and you know, assumed to be Python as the first language. Uh, but because I think because it's like an engineering school, we also have to look for uh, uh, teach engineers programming. Uh, we still use C as the main language. Uh, I don't know if C is switching to Python, but or UCF is switching to Python, but for early classes, particularly for those who are non-majors, I think that course may switch to Python. But from there, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, sh I shouldn't say this. That's my impression that I, I don't know any more than you guys do, actually. But I think for early classes, there, there may be a switch to Python for the very first classes. Uh, but you'll still do C at some point. I mean, if you don't learn pointer C or C++, if you don't learn pointer manipulation, yeah. So if you don't learn pointer manipulation, you lose a lot of uh, connection with how the machine, your actual hardware actually works. <laughs> So yeah, Java and high level languages uh, hide this from you. Yeah, I think there still will be a C, a C course. There still will be C. And maybe at some point we'll compile a different kind of language. I'm actually thinking about doing compilation for a functional programming language. There's, a, there's some good compiler textbooks that show compiling to functional languages. So I, I well, okay, so this is, this is a, you know, this is, uh, you know, everybody's got an opinion about this. There's different philosophies about uh, teaching computing. I've always been interested in kind of systems and low level programming. So I, I, um, I found it easier to go from say C++ and C and assembly to learning Java and high level languages. Uh, Cause it's, it's, I, my philosophy is that it's really important to know your tools and know how they actually work 
and you know, not just how to use them, but how they actually work under the hood. And so when you, oh yeah, am I, am I way, oh, I'm way over, I'm way over. Yeah, okay, so this is, this, we, we should do break time, but yeah. So I, I, I like learning the low level stuff and then moving to high level languages. I find that, that um, it's easier to do because once, if you learn a high level language, you, you, that's your machine model. That's your thinking about how the machine works. Um, and it kind of obscures how there's all this, all these algorithms behind the scene that are turning that into machine code. For me, I found it easier to go from low level to high level uh, because each step of the way, I understand how that high level language is producing the low level code. Oh yeah, so okay, so I've, I've, I'm, I'm way over. Uh, so sorry, oh, sorry for going over, I'm, I'm rambling a lot. I think we got the, the main idea behind, behind types. So yeah, that's static type checking versus dynamic type checking. And then in the second half, we'll learn how to do our project. Uh, and yeah, we'll learn how to do our project. So let's take a break. Let's take a, can we do a five minute break and come back at 11.33? Uh, so that we'll have enough time for the uh, second half. Oh man, I totally lost track of time. So thanks for, uh, thanks for, thanks for pointing out the, uh, the timing. All right guys, so let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back and and uh, do the second half of the, the lecture. So somebody said they simply pretend assembly doesn't, doesn't exist. Yeah, I, I never learned, this. I, I'm not a fluent assembly programmer. So for doing like this compiler stuff, I need to look at a reference manual and, and see what you know gcc's output is i'm definitely not fluent in assembly i think it's not so much you need to know the language but it's really what your mental model of the computer is so even if you don't know assembly just understanding that the mental model is you have ram you have registers and what the kind of basic operations are these two these binary operations and same thing in c you have this you know this have this mental model of instead of just arbitrarily accessing data you have a distinction between pointers and non-pointer data. And once you get to higher level languages, you get these different mental models. So functional programming languages are fairly divorced from the machine, but they give you this really convenient mental model for doing recursive problem solving and for doing, um, yeah, for doing, for, for, so there's a lot of kinds of algorithms that functional programming is really convenient for, not having mutable variables and doing lots of recursive, recursion heavy programming like Compilers, for instance, is very recursion heavy. And so writing these in functional programming languages can be really convenient. And so it is, a, yeah, it is kind of like pretending. It's really the mental model of computation. And there isn't just one. There is the physical machine, the, how the physical machine actually works. And there's a model that is really close to that, the random access model and the registers and registers model. Um, but that's still also a conceit. That's still a model because that's not literally how the machine works. The, the hardware designer still made an abstraction for you, the, the instruction set architecture. My favorite language, I don't really have a favorite language. I view language choice as an engineering decision. You choose the right tool for the job. Uh, I like statically typed languages because they allow me to do, um, they, like other people said, they allow me to catch mistakes. They allow me to use the type checker as a way to prove that my program is safe, at least in terms of types. Uh, but I also use Python quite a bit for uh, basically scripting and prototyping and stuff where the, the, the program is a little smaller. Uh, once you get to really large projects where you have internal APIs, using Python can be a little, a, a little hairy. But yeah, I picked the language based on the right tool for the job, which is the engineering view of, of programming. So did I intentionally wear a shirt to make myself look like a floating head? I noticed it was green when I was putting up the green screen and I was like, oh, it's not... Um, it's not, it's not a problem. But then uh, at some point I became a floating head. So maybe I should change my shirt. So somebody asked, they think they don't like teaching Python first. Yeah, so learning, so I never took a class on Python. Uh, Python is, Python is the kind of language I think where you can, you can learn by just like Googling stuff and looking on Stack Overflow. It's so high level that uh, it's almost designed around doing specific tasks. And I think this is actually the design philosophy of it. It's like, I want to be able to do one thing um, 
uh, it's almost designed around like, here's one way to do it. And here's like the canonical way to do it in Python. And so a lot of it, you can even like just Google and say, how do I read in a file line by line, for instance. But it does include a bunch of really nice mental models of computation, like set theoretic, uh, set builder notation, which comes from set theory. And you can define um, stuff that you'd have to do tons and tons of for loops on. You can define using what looks like kind of like set builder notation from math. So if you, if you, I mean, if you haven't seen it before in math, it may look kind of, kind of uh, confusing and new, but, but just defining algorithms using this set builder notation is actually really convenient and Python lets you do this uh, in a really easy way. So somebody's asking is functional a derivative pr pr procedural or is it, is it separate? I think so. Oh, object orientation is its own thing that has to do with data structures and type systems. Functional. Uh, so, fu so there's like two classic programming languages. There's Fortran, which is in the kind of systems programming and well, kind of, well, it's not really a systems programming language, but in the kind of imperative language for doing uh, numeric computation. And then there's Lisp, which was a very early, uh, well, it actually wasn't even really a functional language, I think when it first came out, but it inspired a lot of the, some of the modern functional languages. Um, functional really came later. Functional came from a lot of, um, yeah, language designers. I don't know the whole history of it, but it came from a lot of language designers trying to make, uh, in particular, trying to make, on one side of it, trying to make languages safer to write and easier to prove things about the language. So it has this history in like um, automatic verification or, or program verification. The OO stuff uh, is kind of orthogonal. You have object-oriented functional languages and you have object-oriented imperative languages and you have functional languages that are not object-oriented uh, at all in the same way that we think of like um, Java style object orientation. Uh, I still use Python quite a bit. But I think if you, if you know C, if, you know, if you're experienced in programming, I mean, that's why it's good to take compilers and good to take uh, uh, programming languages because once you just understand the, the craft of programming and understand that you know, all these languages do the same kind of computation, they're really just different mental models of computation, then it's really about picking the right tool for the job and doing a little bit of, of learning the syntax and learning the kind of idioms in that language. Oh yeah, I also do a lot of Java. I do, I do tons of Java because my, some of, one of my main research projects is in Java. Uh, not necessarily because I, I love Java, uh, but I do think it is actually, I think it gets a little bit of a bad rap. Java is a, uh, Java, is, Java is useful. Somebody was surprised by built-in stuff coming from C to Java. Yeah, so Java is basically C, actually C++ with a, uh, a huge amount of automation for you, huge amount of automation and stronger type checking. So C++ is, um, Well, C++ isn't strictly uh, strongly ch checked because it's backwards compatible with C. Oh yeah, we never touched the void star. All right, let's, uh, let's finish up the type stuff now. So I think we're back, it's 11.35. Uh, let, let, yeah, let, let me finish up the type stuff. I got off on, on a whole bunch of tangents, uh, which is, you know, somebody asked, how do I know if it's gonna fill up three hours? I mean, the way to do it is just to go off, go off on random tangents. Oh yeah, let's, let's look at this uh, void pointer star thing here. All right, so as we saw in C, if I try to assign a floating point number to an integer or vice versa, the compiler will actually insert assembly instructions to do this conversion. But it turns out that I can actually subvert the type system and force, or subvert the type system and actually assign the raw bits of that um, floating point number to an integer and vice versa so that I can actually cause a, a program where the assembly language is taking a floating point representation number that I put like 1.7 and doing a uh, integer arithmetic on that representation. So did, you guys learned about floating point versus integer representation in CDA, I think, right? You guys learned about this, right? Different representations. So if I took the floating point binary and just pretended it was an integer and added one to it as you know, the binary for integer one to it, 
I would not get what I expect in, in floating point, right? Uh, yes, good point. Well, I think what I was, uh, yeah, let me, let me recover this. Uh, Through this and make sure I uh, I got this I got this right. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, let's make this. Uh, let's see how I want this. Okay, so we've got our <clears throat> our. Um, let's do the floating point one first. So we're taking 1.7, multiplying it by the integer two, and then assigning it to a floating point. So any uh, predictions about what this, if I print this out as a floating point number, what are your predictions? What, what am I gonna get from this? Am I gonna get three or am I gonna get 3.4? Let's also look at the integer version of it. So somebody says 3.4 or three. Uh, so this one should be pretty simple. We looked at this already. So y is an integer, 1.7 times two. What should I get when I print it out as an integer? So somebody is also saying maybe 3.0. That's a good guess. So three for this one. And now for this last one, I'm doing a, a little bit of trickery here. Uh, let me actually make sure this compiles before I before I explain this. Let me let me edit. Yeah, we're we're back from the break. Let me let me edit this. I probably should have prepare this ahead of time. Sorry about that. Uh, let me, let me just set this up. So what I'm trying to do here is um, is not right. Sorry, one second. Let me just make sure I have the right. So what I need to do in order to sub subvert the type system is get the addresses to these to, uh, let me just do this, let me just do this from scratch and walk through it. Hoping that this will just work out. So I have two variables here. One is a, a floating point type, one is an integer type. And we already know that if we try to do operations on these, then the C compiler will do type coercion to make sure that these get to make sure that these get uh, converted to the right data type at the assembly level. Let me just work these out. 
All right, so here's our program. This should work kind of as expected. We get three for this one, 3.7 for this one. So in this case, it cast two to a floating point number, did the floating point operation, and then assigned it to a floating point number. In this case, it also casts two to a floating point number, does the floating point operation, but then when it assigns the floating point number to an integer, the compiler inserts a cast to make sure that the result is an integer type. So that when I print these out as an integer or a float, I get the number that I expect. But I can subvert the type system. Um, so let's see, what do I wanna do? I wanna take the actual literal integer by, uh, bits and add them to, using integer arithmetic, add them to the integer bits of the floating point number. So the way I can do that is I can force the floating point number to be an integer. by casting it through a void pointer. So void pointer, I think, void pointer uh, is basically a way to subvert the type system. If you cast something to a void pointer, C will let you cast it to any other kind of pointer. So now what I have here is an assignment of the an assignment of the floating point number to an integer pointer, a pointer to the floating point number cast to an integer pointer. And if I then dereference that pointer, I now have the same floating point data stored uh, in a variable that the compiler thinks is an integer. So now, what do you think will be printed out when I print out this forced int as an integer? So somebody says garbage values. And that's exactly, so no, not no. So there is some data here in memory, but yeah, it's some, so this is, if you took the floating point representation of 3.7 and just took those raw bits of the representation and treated it as an integer, this is the value you'd get. So just to kind of drive this home, if I now make another integer I force the result where I use this forced integer, which was originally 1.7 and add my int num. And I'm definitely not gonna get the, oops. Forced result. And I'm definitely not gonna get 3.7 or three, because this integer is really the raw bytes of the floating point representation of 3.7, not the truncated version of 3.7, which is three. And if we look at the assembly just a little bit uh, for this, Turn off optimization. Uh, you can see that. Well, this is this is the one of the casts here, and well, if we were to go through this, I won't go through this now. But you'll notice that this cast just doesn't happen when we do that second operation because I've basically convinced the compiler not to do this conversion between float and it. So somebody asks, what if you try to add a float to an address, will it truncate it to an int? 
like this. Let's see if it even allows this to be compiled. Uh, so it won't allow floats. It won't allow pointer arithmetic with floats. We'd have to use this trick to coerce that floating point into an integer and then use that integer to do pointer arithmetic. So it would end up, you know, this is the integer representation of three points that the floating point representation for 3.7. This is the, what the init, if you interpreted those bits as an integer, this is what the integer would be, this is what the number would be. And then you just add that to an address. Uh, yeah, so, so C allows, so apparently C allows integers to be combined with, to be operated on with uh, pointers, but it does not allow doubles or other data types to do that. So it's, it's really this, the C designer is explicitly allowed pointer arithmetic. It allows treating pointers as integers, just like you would do an assembly when you're doing certain kind of low level programming tasks. It allows integers, it basically doesn't distinguish between integers and pointers for better or worse. And for worse in a lot of ways because it makes certain kinds of static checks hard. And um, yeah, okay. So that's subverting the C type system. Uh, let me just quickly uh, just point out some terminology in the type world here. So, that, so as we saw with C, there's uh, this distinction between whether the type checker lets it through versus is the program safe? So depending on what we mean by safe, uh, C is weakly typed because if we think that floats and integers should never be assigned to each other without a cast, then C actually allows unsafe programs. So I just showed you a program where we tried to add the, the integer interpretation of a floating point representation to an integer and we get this garbage, what we, what we consider garbage values. So in that sense, C's, C, uh, C's type checker allows unsafe programs through. That's why it's weakly, weakly checked. Uh, and so we can say that this C type checker is not sound. That is, a sound type checker means that if the type checker says the program is safe, that is, if it lets the program through, then that means that the actual program at runtime is safe. So it's like a, it's like a logical proposition. So if type checker safe, therefore program safe. If that's not true, then we have a weekly check type and we have a weekly check type system, then the type system is not sound. So it's if A then B, where A is type checker lets it through and B is no problems at, um, at runtime. Uh, and so if you wanna have a uh, type, a sound type system, then you need to prove that a well-typed program, that is one that the type checker lets through, is actually a safe program. And this kind of uh, work is a big area in programming languages research, where they not only talk about how type checkers should work, but they take the time to go through and prove that whatever your type specification is, that if that type specifier specification is implemented correctly in the compiler, then that will guarantee that the runtime, the programs are safe at runtime. And Java was uh, designed to be such a type system where the static checks combined with the dynamic checks ensures that a, a running program will not ever be unsafe, uh, at least in terms of the definition of safety, like no untrapped errors. Uh, and, and no untrapped errors in Java. And so some programming language theoreticians sat down, looked at the specification of Java, looked at the behavior of the Java language and actually made a proof to show that yes, indeed, if the Java type system is implemented correctly, then um, it won't allow any unsafe programs through. And through that work, that was actually how a, um, a, a uh, problem in the Java type specification was discovered because they found that there were, was some tiny corner cases that allowed unsafe programs to go through where you could corrupt the memory or create garbage data. And that's, that's kind of really important because it's this kind of memory corruption that is the root of so many security vulnerabilities that are still you know, plaguing the, the uh, computing world today. 
Okay, so this is like the type coercion stuff. I already showed subverting C's type system. Okay, so uh, questions on type checking kind of from the big picture theoretical view before we go into how we actually implement this in simple C. So I hope that was like a little bit fun. I know that was a little bit uh, disorganized and random, um, but I kind of like, you know, just taking questions, also just taking questions and trying to play with these, play with these languages, even if I'm not, not prepared to do it, which I obviously wasn't in some of these cases. Uh, but it's a fun little exploration to, uh, to look, at, look at some of these languages and how they work. It'll be way simpler with simple C. So simple C, I've given you, so let, let's look at it. I've given you a much, well, compared to C, it's a much simpler, much simpler type checker. So let's take a look at, um, so, okay, so here's the project. It's now available on the website. So your assignment is here. I haven't put it on web courses yet, but be sure to go to the website and the project is here. So let's go through, let's go through this project. Let's, um, well, actually, let's see what we should look at. Uh, okay, let, let's, let's just, let, I'll just, I'll just go through this top down. So the main goal of this is to do static checking and to implement the type specification of the simple C language. It's basically a subset of what C does. So we, we don't have this type coercion or automatic casting there's no, um, there's no, uh, there, yeah, there's no fancy checks for like null pointer errors. It's, it's, it's very permissive. This type system is very permissive. It's weakly checked like C. It's not gonna have these strong guarantees, the strong safety guarantees. Uh, there's only two primitive types in the language in and, and um, care, which you saw, should have seen already when looking at project one. There's only two of those. And the, um, you know, as we talked about, how do you implement a static checker versus a runtime type checker? Uh, we're implementing a static checker and the way it works basically is we just have our abstract syntax tree from project one. And all we have to do is do a tree traversal. And as we traverse the tree, we um, assign types to each of the expressions. And as we uh, recursively pop up the tree, we make sure that each statement is uh, using these types correctly. So maybe it's actually good to do a, an example of how this type checking works. set up. Okay, I don't know which device it is. Let me, uh, let me check real quick. Where's my whiteboard? Probably a better way to do this, but I don't know it. No. Where is my? Huh. My whiteboard is not. Boot this thing. Ah, okay. The cable was the cable was out. Uh oh. Sorry, 
the cable, the cable was unplugged. Okay, sorry about that. My uh, whiteboard cable was unplugged. Okay, so let's take a look at a, um, a, a simple example of, of type checking in simple C. Say we have the program, uh, let's just assume this is, this is in main. We've got a program that declares a variable x to be int and uh, declares another variable y to be a character. And we return, let's say, x plus y. So unlike C, in simple C, uh, there's no type coercion. There's no automatic um, conversion of types. So in simple C, this would be a type error in simple C. And I, I, in the project document, it outlines the behavior of, of the expected behavior of the type checker. OK. So let's see how the type checker works. First, we have our abstract syntax tree of this version of this program. So I'm going to simplify this abstract syntax tree a little bit because you know you have all these lists of things. But let's just say we've got a our our main method has declarations, and there's two declarations in x and in y. And inside, the, you know, and then there's the body of the, the main method. And finally, the return statement. So our return statement consists of the, let me give myself some space here. And if you, if you look at the AST uh, data structure, it consists of just one expression node and that expression node will contain a um, a binary operation and that binary operation will contain an ident expression which has x it'll have the operator and it'll have another ident expression as the right operand which is just y is everybody with me on the ast any questions on the AST? So I've simplified it quite a bit from what the actual AST looks like just for the sake of space and time. But any questions on the, on the AST? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it should be car Y. Good catch. Thank you. Okay, so we've got our AST, and the way the type checker works, let's look at, so let's, let's look first at the expression. Although, when we do the actual type checking, well, okay, actually, let me just do this top down. So the type checker depends on having a record of depends on having a record of the, well, all right, I'll just, I'll just draw it. I'll just draw it myself. It depends on having a record of which symbols have been declared and which type those symbols are. So the symbol table has the name, and the type of each symbol that we encounter as we traverse the tree. This is actually, in, in some part, one of the reasons why in C you have to declare stuff before you use it, because C wants to be able to do this type checking in one pass of the tree. It doesn't want to have to go uh, look all over the tree to find where your declarations are. So as we're traversing this tree, When we see a declaration, 
we record the fact that we've seen a declaration for X in our symbol table and we record what type that symbol was declared to be by the programmer. So we're traversing this tree top uh, in a you know, post order traversal, the leftmost children first. So we traverse this tree and the first thing we encounter is a declaration or the first thing relevant to type checking that we encounter is a declaration. And this declaration, because of our AST clearly shows what's the symbol part and what's the type part, we can pick out from our abstract syntax tree, well, here's the type and here's the identifier for that declaration. And all we have to do is take that type and that identifier and just put it in our symbol table. This is just a hash map, which I'm sure you all learned about, right? You all know maps, the data structure. So the symbol table is just a map data structure that sets the key for X to the value of as the type from that declaration. Pretty straightforward, right, so far? Yeah, map in, so it's called a symbol table in the compiler world. The abstract data structure of the symbol table is a map. That, that's like the abstract data type name that people use for it. So okay, so we continue our traversal, post order, left to right. And once we're finished this declaration, we go to the parent, which is a declaration list, and we reach the next declaration in that list. So can anyone tell me what the type checker does when it encounters this care why declaration? Exactly, it inserts into the symbol table another entry, mapping the name Y to the type character. Now this is another place in compilers where um, we have to distinguish between the meta language and the language. This type is not only syntax, there's syntax for the type. And it's also, you know, it's also ASCII characters from the input that get turned into abstract syntax on the tree. But now we're also using this to, to uh, define what a type is in our type checker. And so at least in simple C, the way we do this is we take the actual syntactic structure for the type definition, and that's what we insert in the tree. So that syntax structure then becomes a, a new kind of symbol that means a type in our language. So our, our type checker is what's giving meaning to the syntax of types. And the way we do that, the way we do that at the implementation level is we use the literal syntax tree node for a type as the entry in our, in our symbol table to record the type of this symbol. Makes sense so far? So you just have to, you know, distinguish that we're, you know, this is the simple C's types and the simple C's types have a syntax to them. And we use that syntax as the actual reference to a type in simple C. So anyway, I hope that's not more confusing, but, but that's, that's at the implementation level. That's how we're, that's how we're doing this. So the, so somebody asked the type checker gives meaning to the symbols or to the types. It's, it's both. The type checker gives meaning to, yeah, the type checker gives meaning to both. So remember what types are. Types are a set of values and operations on those values. So the type checker is, yeah, the type checker enforces the correct usage of these types. And the way it does it is it has this algorithm to compare, to record and compare the usage of types throughout the input program. Does that make sense? So let, let's, see, let's see how that works. So the first thing is it does is it looks through the syntax of the program and it keeps track of the fact that the, the meaning in the type system of a declaration is that now within scope, 
that symbol X can only be used in the way that types are allowed to be used in our language. So types can all types are the only things that can go or integers are the only things that can go to uh, integer arithmetic in our language. So the type system is, is this is basically an algorithm that enforces that correct usage of symbols in the language. And so it, it's now attaching some meaning to our syntax. We have our syntax tree and now we're ascribing some meaning to that uh, just for the sake of doing just for the type related meaning of the language. So it's, we're not thinking about how, uh, you know, addition uh, and subtraction works at the hardware level yet. We're just looking at the meaning of symbols as they uh, as, uh, we're looking at the correct usage of, of symbols and we're, we're just describing meaning to symbols by recording what types they're declared as. I don't know if I'm articulating that totally, totally right, but let's, let's walk through the rest of this tree and see how that, how that works operationally. Okay. So we've processed these two declarations and in our type checker, we've done, we've processed them by binding the, name of the symbol with the type that it's declared as. So we're starting to in, uh, enforce some of the behavior of our language with respect to types. We continue processing this tree. The body is empty. So there's nothing to process, so nothing for the type checker to process there. And now we get to this return statement. So let me actually say that this is the return, return statement here. We get to our return statement and the type rules in simple C say that in every expression, any operations you do on symbols of the given type, so in this case, int and care, they uh, must be done in a way that matches our type specification. So for simple C, Integer arithmetic can only be done on integer types. So this is just a definition of the language. So I'm defining simple C to be different from C in that in order to do an addition operation, you must have uh, integer types as both of the operands to the plus operation. So one way of saying that is to declare, like uh, build in the fact that plus is a function that takes two integers. Let me give myself more space here. Actually, let me give myself a lot more space to do this. So we have a binary operation that takes an integer a plus and an identifier y. And simple C defines plus the type of plus to be a function that takes two integers and returns an integer. Does that make sense? So there's not, we're not literally de declaring a function here, but in the same way that functions have a type, and we, we talked about this, um, when we talked about the syntax of function types, this arrow notation, just like in, in Haskell, we can um, build into the language as a, an assumption in the language or an axiom in the language that says the plus symbol can only be used when you have two integer operands. When you have two integer operands and it returns an integer. So that's defined by the simple C language. We just make that assumption. We enforce that in our type checker. When we encounter X, the type checker knows the type of this symbol because it recorded, it required that developers or uh, users of the language have to declare every symbol that they use in a decla with declaration syntax. Because of that requirement, the type checker knows that it can find X in the symbol table. And if it doesn't 
have X in the symbol table, then the type checker knows that the, that the user did not declare their X. And so we have a type error. And so the, the type checker could just refuse to compile this program because the definition of the language is you have to declare symbols before you use them. With me so far, questions so far on this? So all the type checker has to do is when it encounters an identifier, it goes to its table, which it keeps, which it, you know, keeps, it's maintaining this, this table globally. And it assigns the type of this usage of X to be whatever the type is. It's declared to be in the symbol table. So at each step of this type checking, algorithm, we can think of the type checker as annotating the tree with the types of the expressions for each for each expression in the tree. So the plus type is built into the language. We just enforce that in our type checker. There's no re there's no symbol table we need for that because we just build it into the language. So now we see why is the right operand. So how do we find how do we check and find, find, how do we find the type of this operand? Exactly, we look at the symbol table. So the symbol table has, it by the definition of the language, the requirement of the user is that you have to declare symbols before you use them. So the type checker can just give up and say, uh, this is not a valid program if the symbol is not defined. And in order to find what the type is, it just looks up in the symbol table and then annotates the tree with the, with, with the uh, type information for this expression. Yeah, you can think of empty body like epsilon. That's, that's a good way of putting it. I, I like that, that's good. So this is epsilon, empty string. Okay, with me so far? Yeah, so when we encounter, so for a, for a binary operation, the type checking rule is recursively check the type of the left operand, recursively check the type of the right operand, then check that the operands match the types of the operator. So in this case, the types of the operator takes two integers. So in this case, does our type checker say yes, this is a valid expression, or no, this is not a valid expression. Nope, good, okay. So somebody asked about floats. Simple C does not have floats. As you saw in the syntax of the language, there's no even word for float in the language. So good, this program does not type check because the type of plus requires two integers. Uh, now to simplify this language, all, um, all binary operations in this language just take two integers and return an integer. Uh, so that way you don't have to like distinguish between, you know, there's no operator overloading, which is annoying. There's no type coercion. So all binary operations in this language, uh, you don't need floating, but there's no floating points in simple C. So you don't have to worry about it in, uh, for simple C. Uh, but to simplify the language, all binary operations, not unary, but binary operations are over two integers and return an in. All right, let's take another example program here. Oh, qu questions on this so far, why this is a type error and how this type checker was able to, by, th by just doing a recursive walk through the tree, was able to prove that this program is not type safe, or prove that it should or reject this program because it's not matching the type safety specification of the language. Any questions so far? In the real world, it depends on the language. So you, you can certainly, so, so it's, it's, just, it's just an implementation decision. You can either, it's, it's just like, do you hard code something in the, in the, in the program or do you have a, a variable that holds it? Uh, so, so languages like C++, 
where you have op you have a language where you actually can do operator overloading. I haven't seen what the compiler does, but I'm assuming that they keep some kind of symbol table for the operators because that, because in C++ you can just name functions uh, instead of naming functions with identifiers. You can actually name them using punctuation symbols. And so yeah, yeah, operators can have um, entries in the symbol table for operator overloading. So we're not going to worry about that here. This is a more more complicated feature. We will have functions in the symbol table, which we'll see in a bit, uh, which do have a function type. But let's let's look at some more examples of expression type checking. Let's take another program here where the developer declares an integer an x to be an integer. And then we have another binary expression here, binary operation expression that takes x and adds it to the constant one. Here's our symbol table. So let's walk through this together. We start at the top of this body. So let's not worry too much about the specifics of what syntax is around this. Uh, when we encounter this declaration, what does the type checker do when it encounters a declaration? Yeah, so operator overloading, exactly. So when you allow, yeah, anyway, that's, that's operator overloading is when you have different types for, for plus. So when, when the type checker sees a declaration, it puts it in the symbol table. So this is the name and the type. So it traverses, it does a post order traversal of the tree. So we, we, when we do a post order traversal of the tree, we're gonna see a declaration. And so, and I'll show you when I, when actually we actually do the coding of this, that you don't necessarily have to go through all of, to the leaves of the tree for everything. So a declaration, you can just pick out the individual elements that you need in order for the type checker. I'll show you that when I show you the coding of this. Okay, so we see the uh, declaration of the tree. We continue doing a post order traversal of the tree. We see X. So how can the type checker find the type? So for expressions, the, the goal of the type checker is to prove that for each expression in the tree, it is correctly typed and to find what that type is. So in this case, for X, right, the leaf of the tree, right, it goes to the symbol table and says, I know, uh, I see an identifier syntax. So an identifiers must be declared before they're used. So I'm gonna look in my symbol table, see if it's there. In this case, it's there. And I tag this tree with the type in for that identifier expression. Continue traversing the tree. I've reached the end, you know, leaf of the tree and I see plus. Remember plus is built into the language to mean you always take two integers and return an int. And now I see the constant one. So what is the type of constant one? In C, for instance, in C, it's in. So this is a case where the constants of the language, just like the, at least in C, the operators, they have a built-in type, a type that is not something that's declared by the user, but the language just defines as an assumption or an axiom in the language. And so here is another place where we're kind of starting to give some kind of meaning to the symbols, the ASCII symbols that we get in our, from our uh, parser. So our parser identified this as the syntax for an integer through the lexer and the parser. Uh, but now the type checker is ascribing t meaning in terms of types to these parts of our language. So it also tags this integer expression with the int type. And from this point of view, you can think of declarations as the user uh, being able to have user defined symbols in the language, being able to extend the language, extend the, the, the amount of symbols that have meaning in the language using declarations. Okay, so now we've, we've finished processing all the leaves of this expression and we get to the, we get back to this binary expression. 
And so remember, the type checking rule for binary expressions is the two operands must match the type of the operator. So in this case, does that hold for this expression? Yes, it holds because the left and the right operands have an int type and that matches the type of our operator. And now the question is, what is the resulting type of this binary operation? Int, good, why is it int? Right, because we can think of this as a function that takes two parameters in and returns an integer value. And because of that, the type checker can infer that the type, even though the developer does not tell explicitly that this binary expression is an integer, the type checker through the declarations that the developer makes, through the predefined symbols in the language called constants and the predefined functions in the language like operators, it can prove that this binary expression has an integer type. Now this may seem a little bit like, yeah, obviously, so obviously a human can do this, but think about this from a compiler perspective. You created a program that can create this abstract syntax tree, but there's no information about the types of the symbols in this language beyond those that we, yeah, there's no information from the syntax tree about what the type of this one is. So in blue, I've written the syntax and in red, I've written the type annotations that the type checker provides. But remember that this is still just some kind of ASCII symbol, or I mean, I, can, I think I converted it to an int or something. But remember, this has no meaning in terms of our compiler yet. It's just some data in a tree structure. And the type checker is able to annotate uh, the information about types in this tree. And beyond that, it's able to actually infer types of various uh, expressions in this, uh, in this uh, tree. So in this sense, type checking is actually a form of theorem proving. It's actually, a, a, and in fact, there are uh, proof assistant tools that can automatically check the validity of a mathematical proof by machine. And because it's equivalent to type checking, these systems will, will have a very sophisticated type system and use a type checking algorithm to validate that a mathematical proof is correct. So these are like the axioms in the language. These are the propositions in the, uh, these are like the axioms in the proof. These are the propositions in the proof and these are the proof conclusions. So it's basically like applying a series of propositional statements to come to a conclusion automatically or to validate that that conclusion is true. Uh, so I think in discrete, you learned about propositional logic, right? Like if, uh, you know, these, did they use this syntax for, for propositions in discrete, this arrow for like A implies B, B implies C? So this is actually why for types, I think why that type theoreticians use this kind of syntax, because there's this equivalence between type checking and proving that a program satisfies its type specification, the language's type specification, and doing a mathematical proof using, using in this case, propositional logic or, or higher level logics. And so it turns out what a type checker is doing and why it can guarantee safety is because it's actually performing a proof about the behavior of the program for all of its possible inputs. Because if we know that this X can only take integer representations and we know that this symbol will only be represented in the compiler as an integer one, and we know that plus only takes integers to integers, we can prove that this entire expression returns an integer. This is unlike assembly where if you had no restrictions and no guarantees except in your head about what the, val what the possible values of a memory address were, 
you as the programmer would have to do that yourself. You'd have to keep track of what those possible, you'd have to prove yourself that this memory address never takes a floating point representation or this memory address never takes a pointer. But with a type checker and with its correspondence to proving mathematical proofs, the type checker is actually quite amazingly a, an automatic proof of the safety of your program, at least in terms of whatever, you know, at least in terms of the type specification of the language. But this is kind of an amazing thing, right? That just with this fairly simple tree walking algorithm, we can prove for all possible inputs to the program certain safety guarantees, like an integer will never be added to a pointer, which in, in our language, in simple C, we don't allow this pointer arithmetic without a, an explicit cast. So let's, let's look at an example of that. Uh, let's look at an example of, say, a pointer. So any questions so far on this, this, uh, this example so far? So let me just, let me uh, augment this example. So I'm just gonna erase this example and, and augment this example. So why do we care about what the binary expressions type is? The reason we care is because in our language, we can have these, whoops. In our language, we can have these nested data structures. Uh, we can have these nested nested syntax. So a binary expression might have yet another binary expression. That say uh, Let's do it this way. So let me add another Let me add another declaration to our language. So let's call this P. Okay. So this declaration, how does this get, uh, what happens to this declaration when we encounter it in our type checker? It's entered into our table, recording the fact that it's a pointer to an integer, not an integer, but a pointer to an integer. We continue walking the tree and also get this integer just like before. We go traverse our binary expression bottom up. We see that x is indeed an integer. Uh, we know that plus is a function that takes two integers and returns an integer. But now when we go to check the type of the right operand, in order to know the type of this right operand, we need to recursively type check this binary expression. This is why it's a, well, this is why it's a post order traversal. Uh, and this is why we need to know the types of expressions before we can type check, because if there's nested expressions, uh, before we can type check the parent expression, we need to first type check, find the type of the operands. Okay, so what happens when we type check this number two? Number two is defined in our language to be an int type. And plus, just as before, is defined in our language to be a function that takes two integers and returns an integer. What happens when we go to P? What type does the type checker determine the P identifier expression to be exactly? It uses the symbol table to say, okay, I know that P is a pointer to an integer. And when I and then, okay, so now we've type checked all the leaves and we get to this binary expression. What does the type checker, what's the result of the type checker for this binary expression? So what's the resulting type of this binary? Good, it's a type mismatch error because remember, in our language, a plus uh, operation must take two integers. This is a pointer int, so we have a type error. Questions on this? Questions on this?
there's no point of arithmetic in simple C. There is, there is point of arithmetic. Um, there is point arithmetic. It's just, you can't do point arithmetic on, uh, oh wait, there is point arithmetic. Yeah, but yeah, but, but yeah, there, there's no, um, you're not allowed to have mismatched types in operators. Yeah, so we can stop, we can halt when we reach a type error. Okay, so let me change this example once more and make it and add a, so I'm gonna do a different example here where instead of P, ah, exactly, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a unary operator, operation for dereference of P. So let's continue our type checking. Now, in order to be able to check and find the type of this binary expression, we need to first find the type of its right operand. So this is a kind of interesting question. What is the type of the unary dereference operator? Can anybody guess or figure this out, what it, what it does? So this is, this is a little bit of a hard question. Well, it doesn't return any values. It's, it's, these are, these are, yeah, it returns. Oh, okay. So somebody, somebody said a good one here. So it says pointer to an int it takes a, well, okay, let me, let me write this over here. So what does star do? star takes a pointer to an int and returns an int. But what if I have two dereferences of a double pointer? Then what's the type of this star? Yeah, it removes a layer of the pointer. So we won't go too much into this, you know, take programming languages and learn about Haskell. But the way we can represent this in the type specification is to say that it takes a pointer to some other type. So we can say alpha means some other type and returns that whatever type it is, alpha. So don't worry about that too much in this class. This is called a type parameter. Uh, I don't teach programming languages. Uh, so in this sense, um, function type functions can actually be over uh, not only variables that have runtime values, but over type parameters themselves. This is like uh, the, the source of generics in Java. But let's not worry about that too much. Uh, and what about P? How do we get the type of P and what is the type of P? So again, P is an identifier expression. So we can find that the type of P is a pointer to an integer. And now for unary operator, each different kind of operator has a different rule about how you find the type of the unary operator. In this case, we just apply this um, pointer function, or this, yeah, this function that takes a pointer and basically unwraps the pointer type uh, so knowing that star unwraps the pointer type and knowing that P is a pointer to an int, what is the resulting type of this unary operation? Good, it's an integer. And because type checking works as this post order traversal over the abstract syntax tree, we now continue our traversal with the binary expression. Ah, yeah, so now everything works. Now we know we can prove that both the left and right operands are integers. And we can prove that because the left and right operands are integers, the binary operation returns an int type. And, um, and similarly, we've now proven that the left and right operands are both integers. And we've proven that this binary expression is an int type. So I'm gonna make a, a slight little correction here now that we know about type parameters a little bit. Strictly speaking, in, in simple C, 
the operator, binary operators, for, for the sake of convenience for code generation, it's, uh, it, it allows any two types to be, um, to be part of the binary operation as long as they return, as long as they're the same type. So somebody asks, they're confused about what simple C does with arrow. In a function, is it two unary operations? Uh, in simple C, we have to look at the syntax in project one. So hyphen greater than sign is a special token called arrow. And so it has nothing to do with unary minus. It is a completely different token that happens to share some ASCII syntax in the same way that the number one can be either part of an integer in C or it can be part of a floating point number in C. Flex produces an arrow token and then the ASC, if you look in the parser under function, under function types, there's no hyphens at all. It's just the arrow token. And so at this point we have an abstract syntax tree. We don't have to worry at all about I mean, we, we don't even have to reference the syntax and the, the tokens anymore. We have an abstract syntax tree that has data structures that allow us to pick out the parts we need in order to do type checking and um, program now. So I, I would say finish pro part project one first and look at the abstract syntax tree you get. You'll see that there's no arrows in that syntax tree, in the abstract syntax tree at all. There's no hyphens or anything in the abstract syntax tree. So finish project one, understand the output of it, and then, um, then move on to this, because that, that'll make it a lot easier once you understand the abstract syntax tree, uh, how the type checking works. Okay, so questions on this type checking algorithm. So this type checking algorithm right now, is this what um, Bison was doing like in the background on our last project, or is no. this like Next step. Okay. No, Bison. So we are right. We we have to write the type checker. So just like everything in compilers, the language there's nothing in nature about the definition of the language. Bison is just a tool to help you get the abstract syntax. Bison does not automa I mean, it doesn't even automatically help you do that, right? You have to write the instructions to create those app those AST nodes. So Bison is just a parser generator. It just does the parsing. What we learned about. Uh, a couple weeks uh, last week. Okay. And just Thank like, you. okay, yeah, yeah. Just like everything in compilers, we define the language, and in our implementation of the compiler, we're expressing, we're implementing that specification of the language. And so for type checking, we get this abstract syntax tree. There's no type information attached to the expressions, there's no guarantees that it's correctly typed. And we write an algorithm that automatically proves that the program is correctly typed. And if we can't prove that it's correctly typed, that is, we can't prove that the two operands to a binary expression are both the same, or we can't prove that the uh, uh, type of a dereference is a pointer, if we can't prove that, then that's a type error. A type error is another way of saying, I can't prove that this program is type safe. So I'm going to stop and tell the developer that they need to rewrite this, or they need to make sure that this program is actually safe before I'm gonna convert it into assembly. Does it make sense? So every step of the way, we are creating what the language is by writing algorithms that process that language. Uh, you, you, for everything, everything is, is pushed to the same repository. So let, let's go over and let's start looking at the code for this. And let me um, walk, you through, walk you through this code. So it's a, it's a lot to digest. So it's, there's this trade-off between uh, making you do all this from scratch and me giving you a template and code to help with. Uh, the trade-off is one, it's, it's way harder to write this from scratch, but the trade-off is you have to grok a lot of this code and understand uh, the code I've given you. And so I've tried to be very thorough in this document, which means there's a bunch to go through and a bunch to, bunch to understand. Uh, so first things first, let's look at the setup. I'm not, I, I'm just, so I'm giving you the delta of this project, the, the stuff you have to add to your project to continue developing it. So notice that your project is not called project one, it's just called simple C compiler. And you're gradually with version control, adding more and more code to your compiler as you would do in, a, as you do in the real world where you're incrementally developing your project and adding features to it. So using your newfound Git abilities and newfound abilities using make files, I've given you new code to add to your project. So you download these files. 
typecheck.c type type is the only thing you need to edit in this project, which I think I wrote somewhere, yeah. So typecheck is the file you need to continue implementing to um, make sure that these get built and linked, compiled and linked, you add type check and table C to your make file. And type check ex exports this check prog function. That's the type checking function. And you call that after you parse the program, but before printing out the tree. So what the type checker will do is it will, just like in our example on paper, it will annotate the tree with the types of each of the expressions. <clears throat> and so check program walks the tree. So parser, if you remember from project one, the parser creates this AST in program underscore AST. Check program walks that tree, annotating it with the types of each expression. <clears throat> and print program will print that AST along with those type checking annotations. So for those of you who are uncertain about your project one, who have not finished it yet, I've also provided a pre-compiled version of project one, at least the parser for it, the parser and, and AST builder for it in parser.tab.o. So there's some instructions here. It's a little bit tedious. It's a little bit you know, finicky to deal with, but uh, you have to basically make sure that you're not going to build your own parser.tab.c. And you know, if you're going to, you're, you're, I'm gonna, you're gonna have to manage uh, developing both at once. I don't, I'm not giving you any functionality to do that. You can look up branching in if you wanna like uh, save this stuff as a branch. But basically I've given you instructions to modify your make file so that you can, instead of building your own parser.tab.c, your own parser, to instead build the parser that, I, that I've given you. So if you make these changes to your make file, download my pre-built binary, and uh, basically overwrite your own .o file. When you type make, it should just build your project using my parser and AST generator. So make sure this, you, you make sure you do this on Vagrant, the Vagrant virtual machine, because um, pre-built binaries are not necessarily portable across machines. This is only if your parser doesn't work. So this is totally optional. This is if you don't, like your parser, you don't think it works, you don't trust it, you think there's an issue in it. If your parser works fine, if you've completed project one, then you only need to do one through three. There, uh, in order to do type errors, I've given you a function called type error, and you can pass it whatever message you want. The message is irrelevant. What matters is the fact that it calls exit three, and I've given you this already. So if you, you encounter a type error in your program, then, um, call type error and it'll automatically handle the error code. Uh, well, so this is a good question. If you pass test cases, can you assume that your program is bug free? So given what we talked about in the very beginning of this class, if you pass a bunch of test cases, can you assume your program is bug free? It's not that it's never bug free, it's that test cases, unless you can show that those test cases cover every possible input, uh, you can't guarantee that the program is bug free. That doesn't have specification. And actually this type checking work gets us a little closer towards proving a program is bug free. Because remember a type checker is proving that the types that the um, program is safe according to the type specification. So if the type specification can be proven to exclude or include only safe programs, then the type checker is actually an automatic proof that your program is bug free according to the specification of the types. Now, whether that proves that your program is bug free according to what you're trying to implement, that's not being proven. Uh, and so there's efforts, there's been efforts actually over several decades to try to specify the behavior of the program. So say you're doing a sorting algorithm, if can you specify the behavior of it using some formal notation, some machine checkable notation, and then use something like a type checker, an automatic theorem prover, to prove that your program's implementation actually matches its specification. So Dr. Levins, the chair of this department has actually done some very uh, well-known work in Java uh, called the Java modeling language where you can describe the behavior of the programming use, program using some math notation and then uh, 
you do, uh, there's some automated checking that will ensure that the implementation of the program is actually bug free with respect to that specification. So no, you can't assume the program is bug free. I can't even assume my program is bug free because I did not formally uh, validate the program. Uh, but if it passed lots of test cases, you can, you can certainly check to make sure it passes the test cases for the type checker in your parser first and then rule out any bugs that way. So that way you know that at least for those test cases, it's not your parser causing the problem. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of rules I've written down about the, the simple C language. So I, I, I recommend going through this on your own um, and making sure you're, you're aware of all these. <clears throat> uh, but actually, actually, first, let me show the code uh, before because we're getting a little bit late in the, in the class. Okay, so here is the, here's the type checker. It's a lot of code to look through, but all that's going on here is we have functions to manage the symbol table. So uh, just like in C, we have scoping rules where if you're nested in a function or nested in a compound statement, you know, between curly braces, each one of those has its own symbol table. So we have functions to manage those which are written for you already. And then we have our check prog for, uh, function, which is the entry point to this type checker. And then the whole rest of this, pro, uh, most of the rest of this file is just one function for each AST node roughly. So this is basically just a giant tree walking program where there's one function for each of the uh, AST nodes that you need for your type checker. And then at the very bottom, I've already given you code to check, uh, call a type error, uh, a signal a type error, and code to check whether two types are equal. So this is a, a bunch of the heavy lifting already done for you. You've got table management handled already. You've got type comparison managed. And the task that you need to do for this project is to uh, fill out these tree walking functions and implement the type specification of the language. Yeah, you don't have to implement a, a table. So I've given you a type implementation actually basically taken from uh, or inspired by at least modern compiler implementation uh, book by Andrew Appel. And so the only things you need to worry about are, well, actually I've, I've given you an API specification in this in here. So the only thing you need to worry about is in order to store a type on an expression, the expression AST node has a type field. Now this is distinct from the abstract syntax for a type in declarations. This is the type field on expressions. So remember, you only need to hold on the AST, you need to annotate the expressions themselves. Uh, the scoping rules, which I, let me talk about scoping rules in a second. I'm gonna go a few minutes over because it's being recorded. I think I'm always going over these days. Uh, uh, current scope holds the current scope. That's where you're going to that's where you're going to find the symbol table. Uh, and because this this language is statically scoped, we um, we need to have a symbol table at each level of nesting. And I'll show that in a second. In order to compare types, I've already given a function for you to do that. You just give it the two types. Now these types can be pulled from either the expression type field. So if you're checking, if you're checking a declaration and you want its type, you get that from the abstract syntax tree. If you want to compare two expression types, you pull the type from the type field that you assign during type checking. And you just pass those two type things. Yeah, um, you won't have to any make any of your own functions. All the functions are there like a template. Uh, the type error function you call when you have a type error, this is written for you already. Uh, and these are the functions to create a new scro scope and, dest and destroy a scope. If you, I mean, you actually don't have to do the, the memory management because the programs are small. Uh, we also have functions to insert and look up in the symbol table. So all of these are given to you. All these functions are given to you. There's no functions that you have to create. You just have to fill in functions. Uh, so this, this works uh, by taking the, a reference to the current table, a string, for the key value, that's the identifier, and the binding. So because this table is generic, it allows any data types, but you're gonna be passing in the declaration type uh, from the AST. 
for a lookup, you give it a table and a key and it will return to you that binding. If that binding is not available, that mapping is not available, then it'll return null. You have to completely, there are some functions that are, um, the functions are completely empty that you have to do. Okay, and uh, this, this one's important for scoping rules. You have to, um, uh, <clears throat> so let me talk about scoping rules for a second. So this will check not only the local scope, but any parent scopes. So just like in C, you have global variables, local variables, and variables inside of uh, compound statements like if statements. Uh, this works by maintaining separate symbol tables at each level of nesting depth. And lookup all, in all scopes is different from lookup in that lookup only looks in a current scope symbol table. Lookup in all scopes will traverse the parent scopes to find the symbol. Okay, let me, so since you can read these type specifications yourself, it's, it's pretty tedious to look over and, and I hope it's pretty specific, specific enough to write the code. Let me actually walk you through the, uh, the code here. Okay, so here's the root of the tree. All I do here is I create a, a couple of constants for various types. So uh, you'll need these when you need to tag constant types or you need to tag pointer types or string types. So these are created for you. So you have these global variables for uh, these types already given to you if you wanna compare types. We create a new scope and then we recursively check the declaration list, recursively check the list of functions and then recursively check the main function and then finally clean up the scope. So the way scoping rules works in short is that at each level of nesting, we create a new scope and each of those scopes has their own symbol table. And then when we're done, we pop back up to the parent scope so that we have access to the parent scope's symbol table. Uh, the lists, I've given you all the lists. They're pretty straightforward. You just, they just, they just loop over the list and recurse and check each one of the elements in the list. This project is harder than project one, not in terms of the amount of coding, but in terms of understanding how type checking works. So I've given, uh, okay, so this is one that I wanna give you in class. So to check a declaration, so, oh, so anyone who needs to leave, please feel free to leave. I'm just gonna go over things that when you go to, the, go to start implementing the project, this will be helpful when you start implementing the project, but the project description should have everything you need to, to do this project. So this is really just recorded content to get you started in the project if you, if you need to get started in the project uh, with beyond looking at the documentation. Okay, so for a declaration, let me just give you what the declaration looks like. So for declaration, all we have to do is look in our current scope. So our current scope holds the symbol table and look to see if that symbol has already been declared already in our current scope. We know that because when we do a lookup, we get null if it's not declared and we get not null if it is declared. And so if it's declared already, then we just call the type error function, which will return, which will halt with exit code three, which is exactly what we need according to our specification. Otherwise we call the insert function on the table, give our current scopes table. We give the string value of the declaration, which is found in ident, you know, refer to the ast.h to, to see what these types are. And then we just take literally the syntax for that type and put it right in the symbol table. Make sense? This is exactly what we showed on paper with type checking. Any, any questions on this so far? Uh, so that I've given you this already, so you can just copy that one. Uh, so any, all the lists I've also given you, you just loop over the list and check them recursively. So check function is gonna be a more tricky one. Uh, but if you take the stuff from check declaration and you take the content from check main and look carefully at the rule, and it's a lot of rules for checking functions and adding to the symbol table. But if you look at these rules, it's almost line for line what the code should, uh, should do. So let's look at check main. Check main is a little bit more complicated because it's a, uh, we're, we're creating a nested scope. Okay, I'm glad, I hope the specification is clear. So I had some complaints last time I gave this that wasn't clear, but I hope this is uh, clear enough. I mean, the header file should have had enough of the information. Okay, so for check main, anytime we have a new nested scope, either a compound statement or a function, we need to create a new scope, which automatically creates a new symbol table for you. 
Um, but we also want to, yeah, so in this, we pass in the current scope because we want to preserve a link to the parent scope so we can get back to it once we're out of the, um, the new scope that we created. So create a current scope. And I've just given to you this, we're going to also create the argc and argv symbols so that, um, so that we can support the uh, um, Unix C runtime. But we'll, we'll talk about that when we do compiler generation. So we just uh, build in these two symbols into the language. We recursively check the declaration list. So this will go through declaration lists and add anything to the symbol table, as I showed you before. And then we check the, all the statements in the statement list. And, we recur and then we check that the main, uh, we recursively find the type of the return expression. And according to our specification of the language, the return type must be an integer in our language. And so in order to check, so once we call check expression, check expression will annotate the tree with the type that the type checker inferred from that expression by recursively going through that tree. And then compare types, you can find that annotated type by using this uh, type field on expression. So this is not a syntactic field. This is a special annotation that all expressions have uh, that gets the annotated type, the type checker. So you as the type checker writer have to set this type on every expression. And then when you go to wanna, wanna use that type, wanna look at it, you check it uh, by, by referring to that field and pulling it out. And so here, because the return type must be an integer, we just compare whatever the expression type that we found during type checking, we compare that with this uh, globally defined int type. So that's why I defined a bunch of pre-made types like string array, string array, int, and char. If it doesn't compare, then if it doesn't match, then we return an error. Uh, okay, so, I'll, I'll, so I've given you to-dos in all the places where you have to implement your part. So for main and in any function, once we're done checking the statements, once we're done collecting declarations, checking the statements, comparing the return type, making sure it matches the function's return type, uh, then we can exit the scope that we created and destroy, destroy it. And importantly, uh, say, when we destroy this scope, we wanna save the parent scope and in our type checker, return to the parent scope. So this is not runtime returning to the scope. This is during type checking, a static scope returning to the parent scope. So if you've ever seen that C is uh, statically scoped or lexically scoped, this is exactly what that means. So that if you take check main and you take check declaration and look at the rules here for function definitions, you should be able to implement check function with a little bit, it takes a little puzzle solving to, to work this all out and, and keeping open the specifications of all these APIs I've given you, but you should be able to work it out. Okay, so uh, this is just um, going through each statement, um, dispatching it to the kind of statement, the function of the kind of statement. And here I've given you a signed statement already. So you can take a look at this on your own, how this actually works, but I've given you the code for this already. Uh, and yeah, you can see how this works and how it matches the type specification. I've given you if statement already. Uh, and so your job is to do the rest of the statements in the language and following the type specification. So I've given you the code to dispatch uh, the type checker based on which kind of expression it is. And so let me just give you the ones that I'm supposed to give you the ones for class. So looking up an identifier is just like we talked about on paper. Uh, so remember, C is statically scoped. When you ask for an identifier, it could be in the local scope, it could be in a parent scope, it could be in global scope. And so in order to uh, implement that behavior, that static scoping, use the lookup in all scopes function, which will search not only in the local scope, but recursively search through the parent scopes. And this is given to you. So look for the binding. If it's not found in any scope that you have access to, it's a type error. If it's, um, if it's a function type, uh, in, in simple C, you're not allowed to access the value of a function. So functional languages can treat functions as values. Simple C and C cannot. You can do function pointers in C, but you can't take a, something declared as a function and 
use it, try to get its value. So this is just calling a type error for that. And then finally, uh, we set the expression type to be whatever the type of that symbol was, just like we did on paper. And I'll leave it to you to implement call expression. Call expression is a little trickier. Just look at the, the, the documentation for how to do that. Let me also give you some of the constants here. So I'm going way over. If you need to leave, by all means leave. This will be recorded. You can just skip ahead to this section. And I'll go to office hours in a second. But let me just give you all the stuff that's given in class to get you started. So this was the example we did on paper. Uh, the ones in class you have to copy from the video or figure out from the specification. So if it says given in class, then you know, oh, look, look in the class recording. So for constants in the language, these are the axioms or the leaves of the tree. We are, this is where the built-in definition, uh, built definition, definition of the language comes into play. So we just literally say, if we see an integer AST node, then we just set its type to be int type. Uh, what else do I give you? So similarly for character and string and array, and I've given you some, I've given you stuff for string already. Array, you have to construct the type. Uh, what else to give you? So, okay, so just look at the, the type specification for the rest of these. Uh, and that's it, that's all I'm giving you in class. So your job is to implement the rest of these expressions. The rest of these expressions to implement, I mean, it's, it's all here in the, type, in the type specification. So it explains static scoping rules. A lot of it's given to you already. It explains function definition, checking and setting the type. It explains you statement, you know, if conditions have to take an integer, they can't take a function type or any other type or a pointer type, they have to be an integer. And here's all the rules for each of the expressions. And so uh, remember, so here's a little bit of tips here. Remember that every one of these check expressions should be setting the type because that's what you need in the parent in order to check that the operands of the parent expression are right. When you're writing this type checker, you probably need like several things open at the same time. You should have the AST reference so you know how to access each part of the uh, abstract syntax. You should have the type AST reference. So like pointer type versus array type, that's part of the AST reference. And these type rules in this document. If you have those three things, you should be able to puzzle together uh, finishing this type checker. And so just as a little bit, something that's a little, might be a little confusing to wrap our heads around is that the way we represent a type is we don't have a special value for it. We just use the abstract syntax for that type, which is a, a common trick in, in uh, modern compilers actually to do that. All right, so uh, any, any questions uh, about this? Yes, there'll be office hours there right now. I am way, way over. Uh, I know I'm going over a lot. If I get complaints and people say, make sure you stay on time, please let me know. I haven't seen any complaints. That's also rec uh, recorded, so you can at least go back if you missed it and go back. Uh, no problem, no problem. Yeah, thanks for uh, tolerating this going over. I tend to go on tangents and uh, uh, yeah. So have a good weekend, everybody. I'm gonna switch to uh, office hours now. I know this is a lot to digest. We got two weeks now to do this. Um, come to office hours. We have office hours over the whole week. I hope everything is, there's enough documentation here to do this. The main thing is to understand, oh, and read, you can read the Dragon Book. Uh, read the Dragon Book to look at a, a more formal and rigorous specification of these types. I hope the informal, in, I, I tried to give you an intuitive description of the type checking algorithm, but you can read the book on it. You can look at all of this API documentation and the specification documentation, and this should, it should be, should be um, enough to be able to puzzle this together. You'll have to use your, you know, your, your programming software engineering skills to debug and everything, but all right. Uh, the password is in the announcement, is in the uh, web courses. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over to Gather for our, for our office hours and I'll be there in uh, just a minute or two. Thanks everybody, have a good weekend and take care, bye-bye.